The story continues with Makoto on his way to the city of Rostgard, and we see that right now he is in the city of Obit. He thinks that walking is exhausting, and Shiki mentions that it is, but it's better than being caught by the goddess while they teleport. Makoto mentions that she might toss them into battle again, and he thinks that everything is the fault of the goddess. Shiki mentions that they are almost at Rostgard, and he states that he will find them an inn, and he asks Makoto to get something to eat in the meantime. Makoto mentions that he is fine with any inn, and Shiki states that he can't allow that. He mentions that Tomoe and Mio are going to be mad at him if he gets Makoto a cheap inn, and Makoto wonders if putting the two of them in charge of the demiplane was really a good idea. The scene then cuts to the demiplane, and Tomoe finds out that Mio has become interested in cooking, and she wants to make something that Makoto likes. She mentions that she can understand this, but she wonders how a simple taste testing went so wrong. Mio states that she doesn't know, and Tomoe thinks that she was right to have the young master's food tested for poison. Mio wonders if Tomoe is calling her food poison, and she mentions that she only made curry rice based on the young master's memories. Tomoe asks her if she has ever eaten curry rice before, and Mio states that she hasn't as it's food from another world. Tomoe wonders if she asked Makoto for the recipe, and Mio states that she didn't as she wanted to give him a surprise. Emma then asks Mio if this green object in the curry is an ore, and Mio states that it is. She mentions that she thought that this would taste heavenly, and Burin finds out that Mio put soft emerald in the curry. Komoe then mentions that the curry also had the pot's handle in it, and Mio notices that the pot has melted. She then tastes the curry herself, and she thinks that it's not bad enough to knock someone out. Tomoe then tells Mio that many species in the demiplane, and the young master himself, don't eat mineral ores. They also don't eat weapons or buildings, and Mio is shocked to hear that those things aren't food. Tomoe wonders if Mio has ever studied the art of cooking, and Mio states that she at least knows how to use fire. Tomoe then asks Mio to make a piece of slightly burned toast, but Mio burns the bread completely, and Tomoe states that Mio has a lot to learn when it comes to cooking. This video is sponsored by Game of Vampires, Twilight Sun. Welcome, fellow creatures of the night, to a world where darkness reigns supreme, where power lies in the hands of the immortal. Welcome to the Game of Vampires. In this enchanting fusion of light and darkness, you'll embark on a journey unlike any other, where the fate of two worlds hangs in the balance. Will you embrace the light and protect humanity, or will you succumb to the allure of the night and revel in your newfound powers? In Game of Vampires, Twilight Sun, you have the opportunity to promote wardens, formidable allies who wield immense power. Convince them to join your cause, unlock unique abilities and new wardens, and lead your faction to victory. Experience the allure of forbidden romance as you interact with a diverse cast of characters, each with their own desires and motivations. Will you kindle flames of passion, or will you keep your heart shrouded in darkness? Shape the destiny of your domain by building and managing your own town. From humble beginnings to sprawling metropolises, every decision you make will impact the prosperity and security of your people. So, my fellow vampires, are you ready to embark on a journey into darkness? Will you seize power with an iron grip, or will you succumb to the shadows that lurk within? The choice is yours in the game of vampires, Twilight Sun. Download now and join the eternal struggle for supremacy, the link is in the description, and pinned comment. The scene then cuts to Makoto eating some kind of blue meat, and the owner of the restaurant he is eating it asks him to not make such a repulsive face while he is eating, as his face is bad enough as it is. Makoto apologizes for this, and he mentions that this dish is delicious, and the owner is surprised to see that Makoto writes with magic. Makoto explains to him that he can't speak the common tongue due to various reasons, and he wonders if the main ingredient of this dish is slime. The owner thinks that Makoto is well informed, and Makoto thinks that slimes taste great. The owner mentions that Makoto seems like an accomplished adventurer, and he states that he has posted a slime hunt quest in the guild, and he would be glad if Makoto could take it. Makoto states that he is registered at the Adventurer's Guild, but he is mainly a merchant, and he is traveling to Rostgard. Hearing this some people at the restaurant look at Makoto with a creepy smile, and Makoto leaves the restaurant after paying with a gold coin, and he also doesn't take his change. He thinks that he is out of change, and he wonders if this makes him a bad merchant. Makoto then walks around town, and everyone who looks at him is surprised to see how ugly he is. He then goes to the guild, and he looks around for some quests, 
and he notices that the slime capturing quest is a B rank job. He thinks that he can't take it as he is still A rank, and a girl then comes into the guild, and she mentions that Moon over the ruined castle is going to attack their town soon. Makoto overhears this, and he thinks that this is the name of a song, and he wonders what the girl means. He then finds out that this is the name of a bandit group here, and the girl wonders why no one is willing to take the quest to fight these bandits even though she is willing to pay for it. The receptionist states that they are talking about a group of ferocious bandits, and there are more than a hundred of them. Right now, they lack the combat strength to take them on, and she should come back next month as they are going to have enough fighters then. The girl can't believe this, and she wonders if they have been abandoned by the goddess. Some guys then tell the girl that they can give her a discount, and they try to get handsy with her, but the girl runs out of the guild crying, and Makoto notices this. Afterwards we see Makoto in an alley, and he thinks that paying with a gold coin was a bad idea. He uses his kai to notice that three people have followed him from the restaurant, and some people from the guild are troubling the girl he just saw. Makoto defeats the guys from the restaurant, and he throws them at the adventurers from earlier to save the girl. Makoto then defeats the remaining adventurers, and the girl wonders if he is helping them because he is a demi-human like his friend here. Makoto states that he is human, and he uses his kai to heal the injury of the girl's demi-human friend. Makoto then introduces himself, and he mentions that he is an adventurer, but he is mainly a merchant. The girl then thanks him for saving them, and she introduces herself as Rana from Tapa Village, and she mentions that her friend here is named Ido, and he is a werewolf. Makoto thinks that he is different from the werewolves he has imagined, and he offers to carry Ido for her. They then walk towards Rana's village, and Makoto asks the girl about the bandits she mentioned earlier. Rana tells him that the bandits attacked them recently, and they tortured Parley to death to make an example out of him, as he was the strongest of them. The villagers are now giving in, and they are handing over their money and savings. She mentions that every village they have been to, has been slaughtered and robbed clean, and her village is also doomed now. Ito then wakes up, and he asks Rana if the guild is going to send help. Rana tells him that the guild has refused, and Makoto then thinks that he is used to death at this point, and it's more common in this world than his last one. He thought that he had accepted this, but it seems that he hasn't. He then mentions that he will send them back to the village, and he asks Rana where it is. Rana tells him that it's over those mountains, and Makoto jumps over to her village with Rana and Ido, and the two of them are surprised to see this. The scene then cuts to them at Tapa village, and Rana mentions that she wants to thank Makoto properly, and she asks him to wait here for a while, and she goes to inform the villagers about this. Makoto wonders if Ido is not going to go after her, and Ido is surprised that Makoto can speak werewolf, and he mentions that it wouldn't be right for a demi-human to enter a human village. He states that his village is in the woods ahead, but Rana and some villagers are close to him. Makoto then checks the village with his investigative Kai, and he notices that the bandits have killed some people again. He then mentions that he knew that Ito was awake when he was carrying him, and he wonders if he pretended to be unconscious because he felt like he was the one who put Rana in danger. Ito states that he is right, and Makoto asks him to keep her safe the next time, if he wants to be with her. Makoto then uses his investigative Kai to find out that the bandits are in the mountains right now, and he goes after them. Ito warns him against this, but Makoto doesn't listen, and Ito asks him why he is doing all this. Makoto mentions that the moon over the ruined castle is the name of a song in his country, and he loves it dearly. He doesn't like a bunch of bandits naming themselves that, and he wonders if this is reason enough, and he leaves. The scene then cuts to some other demiplane residents testing Mio's cooking this time, but the results are the same. Mio thinks that she even used premium ingredients this time, and she wonders how this happened. Tomoe notices that the dishes Mio made look nothing like what they are supposed to, and she mentions that great ingredients don't necessarily guarantee great taste. She states that different races also have different palates and preferences, and all of the different species in the demiplane then tells Mio what kind of food they like, and Mio thinks that she never knew that cooking would require such profound knowledge. Tomoe states that they should ask Lime if they want to match the preferences of the young master, but it would be stressful for him to do this alone. She then tells Mio to travel around the world to improve her cooking skills, and Mio thinks that this is a great idea. She mentions that she is going to embark on a culinary journey for the sake of the young master, and everyone is happy to hear this. 
Tomoe then thinks that she should also start her investigation, as she doesn't want the young master to be caught up in any trouble. The scene then cuts to the bandits in the forest, and they are planning their next move. We see that Makoto has put on his mask again to fight them, as he doesn't want to expose his identity, and he uses Silence Kai to silent all sounds in the area. The bandit leader is surprised to see that he can't make any sounds, and Makoto then shoots the bandits one after the other. While shooting he thinks that he vowed to never get involved in human affairs, but here he is eliminating bandits for humans. He thinks that he also made his mind to act on his emotions when he hesitated, and he goes to the bandits after thinning down their numbers. He thinks that he has only knocked the bandits out, and he has missed their vital organs. He then puts away his bow, and he uses fire magic to defeat the rest of the bandits. This causes an explosion, and the villagers notice this. Makoto then tells the bandit leader that he is not going to kill them, and he asks him to not call their group the moon over the ruined castle. The scene then cuts to the villagers finding the bandits tied to a tree, and Rana asks Ito if this was done by Makoto, and Ito mentions that it was. She then thanks the goddess for this, and afterwards we see Makoto with Shiki, and Shiki asks him where he was all day. Makoto states that he was taking care of some business, and he asks Shiki if he has found an inn. Shiki mentions that he has, and it costs three gold coins a night. Shiki then tells Makoto that the heroes he mentioned earlier have received a hospitable welcome in Linnea Kingdom and Gritonia Empire. He states that Makoto is the only one forced to live a frugal life, and he thinks that he can't accept this. Makoto then explains that he saw other heroes when he was teleported to the battlefield, and he wonders if he is ever going to meet them again. The story then goes back in time to the days before Makoto was summoned to another world. Makoto is walking around the school like usual, and a girl named Hibiki Otanashi approaches him. She mentions that the date on the document that he just received from the student council is wrong, and she exchanges his documents with the correct ones. Makoto thanks her, and he leaves. Hibiki then thinks that Makoto Masumi is said to be the hero who went and joined the student council, where all other members are handsome guys, and he is just an average Joe. Hibiki thinks that he doesn't look like a hero, but she does envy him a little. She thinks that with some effort, she can get anything that she wants, and she keeps trying new things, but she never encounters any setbacks, and everything goes smoothly for her. She thinks that she really has an easy life, but it's utterly boring. Hibiki then unexpectedly gets summoned to another world, and she wonders where she is, and the goddess tells her that she is in another world. She mentions that the world under her protection is being attacked by demons, and it's in a crisis unlike anything before. She hopes that Hibiki can lend her strength to her, and she mentions that her plan is to send Hibiki and another person to her world as heroes. She mentions that she will do her best to bless Hibiki with some power, but Hibiki refuses the goddess's offer, and she asks her to get someone else for this job. She mentions that she has plenty of friends, and her life has been really smooth until now. The goddess then asks her if she wants to spend the rest of her life with friends, whom she shares no connection with. Hibiki asks the goddess what's her point, and the goddess mentions that the world that Hibiki is in right now is too small. She states that Hibiki must have longed for a friend who will always have her back, and a life worth taking risks for. This piques Hibiki's interest, and the goddess states that she will bless Hibiki with powerful magic, and increase her physical strength. She will have charismatic leadership, and she will also have a divine item. The goddess gives Hibiki, a silver belt, and she sends Hibiki to Limia Kingdom after telling her that she has high hopes for her. Meanwhile at Limia Kingdom, the king receives a prophecy from the goddess about the descendants of a hero, and he thinks that Limia can finally be free from the torment of the demons. Hibiki then gets teleported to the kingdom, and she notices that many people have gathered to welcome her. The goddess tells everyone that she is the hero, and she asks them to treat her well. Hibiki wonders if this is all the goddess has to say, and she finds it hard to believe that this is another world. While all this is happening, Makoto was still wandering around the wastelands, and no one was there to welcome him. Days after Hibiki is summoned, she notices the map of the continent which looks like Japan. She mentions that the demons have been forced to live on a barren land by the goddess's people, but they have expanded their territory for a decade. This led to the fall of the Kingdom of Elcyon, and then the Limia Kingdom allied with Gritonia Empire to draw a last line of defense. Hibiki then remembers that the officials didn't like it when she told them that there is another hero, 
and it's in the Gritonia Empire. She thinks that it's only natural for neighboring countries to be unfriendly, and she thinks that she should get ready for the worst, after the war with the demons ends. She then mentions that the belt that the goddess gave her, had a wolf spirit in it, and she thinks that she never expected this. Habiki then thinks that tomorrow she has to choose her party members from a group of mercenaries, and she notices that based on the king's recommendations the confirmed members are the court magician Woody, and a rising star among the knights called Norst. Habiki thinks that she can smell nepotism in this, and the scene cuts to her choosing her party members the next day. A girl named Naval notices Habiki during the recruitment, and she thinks that she doesn't smell blood on her. She thinks that Habiki doesn't belong on the battlefield, and she tries to leave, but the court magician Woody stops her. He asks her if she is leaving already, and Naval mentions that she is not interested in becoming some elite student's bodyguard, as she just wants to kill demons. She tries to leave again, but Habiki stops her, and she mentions that Naval seems like the strongest fighter here. She states that she wants her to join her party, and train her in swordplay, and she mentions that she would also like for her to be her partner in battle who will watch her back. Naval mentions that she can entrust her life to someone who needs sword training from her, and Habiki whispers to her that she knows that Naval just wants to slay some demons, and if she follows her then she will be able to kill as many of them as she wants in the front lines. She can guarantee that Naval won't get bored, and she states that this is much better than rejecting her offer, and not being able to stay in this country. Naval accepts Hibiki's offer, and a knight named Norse thinks that Hibiki is really beautiful, and he needs to find a way to stay with her. While all this is going on Makoto was fighting a dragon, and the dragon fell in love with him. Afterwards the scene cuts to Linnea Kingdom's border, and Hibiki and her party are there to pick a priestess from the Laurel Commonwealth. They then notice that the priestess's carriage is in trouble, and she is surrounded by kobolds. Norst mentions that these are monsters that become stronger by devouring mana, but they are very strong. Rudy states that the priestess from Laurel is amazing for being able to hold off so many enemies with her shield, and Nabel notices that there are four kobolds. She mentions that they will all have to take one out, and unless they finish them quickly, they might summon reinforcements with a scream. Nabel asks Habiki if she is going to be fine as she has never slayed a monster, and Habiki mentions that she will be all right. All of them then attack the kobolds, and they manage to take one of them out, but Habiki fails to deliver a fatal blow, and the kobold asks her to save him. This makes Habiki hesitate to kill it, and the kobold screams to summon reinforcements. A bunch of kobolds then come running, and Naval and the others fight them, and Naval asks Habiki to stand down. The kobolds overwhelm their party, and they almost manage to break the priestess's barrier. Habiki thinks that this is all her fault, and she then slays the kobolds in rage. She states that as the hero she has to keep moving forward, and the others follow her lead to defeat all of the kobolds. Afterwards Hibiki cries because of the carnage she has caused, and Naval mentions that she did great for her first time. The priestess then thanks the hero for saving her, and she introduces herself as Chia. She asks to join the hero's party, and everyone is surprised to hear this. They try to stop her, but Chia cuts her hair and she mentions that if her people see her hair then they might think that the people of Limia have done something bad to her, and Habiki's party members can't believe that she is threatening them. Chia mentions that she just wants to end this war, and Habiki tells her that her threat is too contradicting. She mentions that Chia shouldn't have cut her beautiful hair, and Chia mentions that her hair would only get in the way during battle. Habiki and Naval mention that they should also cut their hair in this case, and Chia tells them that they don't need to as they are already really strong. Hibiki tells her that this is also true for Chia, as her magic shield was amazing, and she asks Chia to teach her how to use magic. Chia agrees, and Hibiki mentions that they secured many victories in their war with the demons after that, and they never lost a battle until they ran into the Black Spider of Calamity. They try to fight the Black Spider of Calamity, but they stand no chance against it, and the spider regenerates almost instantly after they injure it. The spider then defeats all of Hibiki's party members one after the other, and seeing her party members get injured Hibiki tries to fight the spider in rage. She manages to injure the spider's eyes, and the spider also badly injures her. She wonders if she is going to die here, and she faints. She opens her eyes on a bed in the castle, and she notices that every one of her party members have also survived. She is surprised that they lost even after they fought with everything they had, and she thinks that defeat is unbearable. 
She thanks the Black Spider of Calamity for this defeat, and she mentions that she is going to defeat it the next time. The story then goes back in time to a few days after Hibiki was summoned, and we see some guys bullying a boy named Tomoki Iwahasi. We find out that Tomoki is a model, and the guys are trying to get some money from him, but Hibiki refuses them. The guys try to beat him up, but Hibiki is saved by some girls, and he flees the scene as he gets embarrassed being saved by girls. The scene then cuts to him playing video games in his house, but he is still irritated about earlier, and he tosses his video game aside. He lies down, and he notices an isekai novel beside him, and he thinks that if he has a cheat power in another world, then even he can be brave. The goddess then summons him to another world, and she introduces herself. She tells him that the world under her protection is crawling with monsters, and she wants him to save her world by becoming a hero. She mentions that he doesn't need to worry as she has sent another person to this world, and he will also be blessed with her power. Tomoki asks her what kind of power he is going to get, and the goddess tells him that he will get a body capable of combating monsters, and magical power that pales in comparison to demons. He will also get the devil eye which makes people submit to his will, and a pair of silver boots which gives him the ability to fly, while dispelling fatigue from his body. Tomoki thinks that these are all cheat skills, but he thinks of all this as a dream, and he asks the goddess if this is all he is going to get. The goddess mentions that she can also grant him a body that cannot die at night, but this power can only be used when the moon is out. Tomoki asks the goddess if she can change his look into something he wants, and the goddess states that she can. The goddess then changes his look, and she sends him to the Gritonia Empire. Tomoki is welcomed by the princess named Lily Flaunt Gritonia in the Empire, and she tells him that she is the second princess of Gritonia. Tomoki also introduces himself, and Lily asks him to come with her as this is not a good place to talk. On the way a female knight named Genebia asks the princess if the prophecy was true, and the princess introduces Tomoki to her. Tomoki takes a close look at her saying that he has never seen a female knight, and Genebia tells him that this is rude. Tomoki unwillingly uses his devil eye on her, and this makes Genebia attracted to him, and she doesn't mind him being rude. Lily notices this, and she takes Tomoki to test his level and his compatibility with magical items. After the tests Tomoki is tired, and Lily tells him that she will send someone to him at night to show him around the castle. She asks him to rest for the time being, and the princess then asks a doctor about the results of Tomoki's test. The doctor tells her that Tomoki has some kind of magical eye that bolsters the effect of charming, and Lily asks the doctor to help her in negating the effects of Tomoki's eye on her, and the rest of the royal family. She asks him to not tell of this power to anybody else, and she thinks that she doesn't like the innocent look that the hero has. Afterwards Lily introduces Tomoki to their alchemist named Yukinatsu, and she mentions that Yukinatsu wants to talk with Tomoki. Yukinatsu is energetic, and she tells Tomoki that she is an alchemist, but she doesn't mix potions, she makes golems. Tomoki gets excited to hear this, and he accidentally uses his devil eye on her as well. Yukinatsu then mentions that she heard that Tomoki can use every magic item that there is, and she states that she would like to have a discussion with him in her room. Lily interrupts them, and she mentions that the two of them can talk another day. The scene then cuts to Tomoki wandering around the castle, and he notices a dragon. He notices a girl around the dragon, and he finds out that she is a dragon summoner named Mora. The two of them then talk, and Tomoki asks Mora if she lives in the castle with her family. Mora tells him that she doesn't, and she mentions that her family was attacked by demons, and they only came here because Princess Lily took them in. Tomoki then accidentally uses his devil eye on Mora as well and she gets charmed by him, and she asks him to marry her. She mentions that she wants him to be her family, and the scene cuts to Tomoki telling Lily that he has formed a party with three people. He tells her that it's Genebia, Yukinatsu, and Mora, and Lily thinks that Tomoki still doesn't seem to have any control over his devil eye. Tomoki then asks Lily what she thought about him when she first saw him, and Lily states that she knew that he was the hero that would lead them to greatness. She mentions that Tomoki is a great hero, and everyone admires him, and she kisses him. The two of them then spend the night together, and afterwards Lily thinks that she is willing to sacrifice anything as long as they get to wipe out the demons. She thinks that this is all for the sake of her mother who believed in that wayward goddess, and while all this is going on Makoto enters into a contract with the black spider. The scene then cuts to Tomoki returning to the palace after a battle, and Lily greets him.
She mentions that Tomoki did great in their last battle like usual, and next they will try to reclaim Fort Stellar from the demons. She tells him that they will be allying with Linnea in their next battle, and Tomoki states that he will finally get to meet the other hero. Lily wonders if Tomoki is interested in the Linnean hero, and she mentions that she has heard that the hero of Linnea is gorgeous. Tomoki states that Lily doesn't need to worry as he only needs her, and his friends here, and Lily gives a manipulative smile hearing this. The scene then cuts to Hibiki and her party in the army camp near Fort Stellar, and Hibiki finds out that there is going to be a ball. She thinks that they will likely confirm the strategy to reclaim Fort Stellar there, and Mabel tells her that she should think of it as a party to raise the army's morale. She mentions that she has heard that the hero of Gritonia is praying for the goddess's blessing, and she states that if their enemies are demi-humans or demons, the goddess would bestow them her blessing unconditionally, and this gives humans the advantage. Hibiki then makes a concerned face, and Naval asks her if she is nervous about meeting Gritonia's hero. Hibiki mentions that this is one of the reasons, and she states that she has heard that the other hero is around her age, and he is also from her world. Afterwards Hibiki and her party meet Princess Lily and Tomoki, and Lily explains the battle plan to them. She mentions that the King of Ion has provided both supplies and reinforcements, but the amount from Laurel is less than expected, and Hibiki's party should know why. Hibiki thinks that they must be mad because of the matter with Chia, and Lily mentions that there is no need to worry as their combat strength is five times that of the demons, and with the goddess's blessing, victory should be theirs. She asks them if there are any other questions, and Hibiki wonders why the battle is taking place at night. Tomoki tells her that it's because they are good with night battles, and Hibiki hesitantly states that this is good, as they have no experience with it. Tomoki wonders if Linnea has any plans or suggestions, and Hibiki states that they don't. Tomoki mentions that it should be fine as this is only a minor boss, and the goddess's blessing is going to buff their strength, and debuff their enemies. He mentions that they must reclaim the fort with haste, and earn the goddess's praise, and he states that they should relax and chat now. Hibiki then asks Tomoki if they have ever met in the real world, and Tomoki states that they haven't. Hibiki then remembers that Tomoki has the same name as the model that her friends liked, and Tomoki annoyingly tells her that this has nothing to do with him. Hibiki apologizes for mistaking him for somebody else, and upsetting him, and Tomoki mentions that he is not upset. He then asks Hibiki her level, and she states that it's 430. Tomoki mentions that his level is 603, and Hibiki wonders why he is suddenly showing off his level. Hibiki states that Tomoki must have worked hard, and Tomoki mentions that this is why she should stop calling him by his first name, and call him Mr. Tomoki instead. Hibiki mentions that she will be mindful in the future, while thinking that he is the one who told them to relax and chat, and Tomoki states that he will be using her first name as he is not good with honorifics. Hibiki agrees, and she wonders what's wrong with this guy. The scene then cuts to Hibiki staring at the sky, and Naval asks her what's keeping her awake. Hibiki mentions that she is worried that this might be too much for them to handle, and Naval asks Hibiki why she came to this world. Hibiki mentions that in her last world, she was born in a good family, and she could achieve anything with the slightest effort. Naval states that she did get that kind of feeling from her, and she mentions that she never expected Hibiki to go into battle. She mentions that Hibiki cried like a baby because she couldn't kill the kobold, and Hibiki states that this was the first time she tasted defeat in her life, and the first time she could entrust her life to someone else. She mentions that there will be worse hardships and surprises ahead of them, but she doesn't regret coming to this world. She then states that they should turn in for today, as they do have a battle to fight tomorrow, and the scene then cuts to Tomoki, and the soldiers praying for the blessing of the goddess the next night. Afterwards we see the commander of the demon army named Rona receiving information about the marching paths of Limian and Gritonian troops. She finds out that they have just received the goddess's blessing and are moving forward. Rona mentions that everything is just as she has anticipated so far, and she states that she is going into the fray, and she asks the soldier to inform Eo about this. The scene then cuts to the human army marching ahead, and Woody asks his party mates to watch for enemy traps as this terrain is perilous. He mentions that they have lost too many knights and mages on this route, and they are then attacked by the demon army. Tomoki orders his troops to engage, and they all fight the demon soldiers. They manage to defeat most of them easily, and Hibiki thinks that their enemies seem a little too weak. 
She mentions that she was told that it was impossible to even reach the fort using this path, and she asks Chia to deploy a barrier and Woody to cast a levitating spell for high-speed movements as a precaution. The human army then manages to reach the gates of the fort, and they open it. Rona then notices that the two heroes are in range, and she states that it's time to put their strengths to test. She uses a magic array to make the entire human army fall into a giant pitfall, but Hibiki's party manages to survive due to Woody's levitation spell that he casted earlier. Tomoki also manages to survive due to his flying boots, and Rona tries to attack him with magic, but he manages to counter her attack using his divine lance attack. Tomoki then wonders if his party members are alright, and he notices that they are fine due to the replica of his boots that Yukonatsu created. He is glad to see this, and he asks Mora to summon the dragon named Nagi. The dragon then comes there, and Tomoki attacks the fort while riding it. Rona thinks that the dragon's firepower is as formidable as she has heard, but they will need to do more to capture this fort. Tomoki then lands inside the fort, and he asks Mora and Yukinatsu to provide support while he charges ahead with Genebia. They then come across Eo, and Tomoki attacks him. Eo mentions that it's rude to attack without introducing themselves first, but Tomoki states that manners don't mean anything in battle, and he attacks Eo again. He manages to take out one of his arms, and Hibiki then attacks Eo as well, but he manages to block. She then introduces herself, and Eo introduces himself as the general of the Demon Lord's Third Legion. He instantly regenerates his arm, and the heroes are surprised to see this. Eo then uses a ring to nullify the goddess's blessing on the heroes, and this weakens both of the heroes. They can't believe that the goddess's blessing has been negated, and Tomoki thinks that this means that he can die if he receives damage right now. He then states that they should fall back, and Hibiki wonders if he is going to leave her to fight alone. Tomoki tells her that she should also fall back, and he states that they are heroes, and they can't afford to fall here. He mentions that they can always regroup and retaliate, and Hibiki agrees with his reasoning, but she can't let all those sacrifices be for nothing. She stays behind, and Eo mentions that it's a shame that she must fight alone. Hibiki states that she is not alone, and the rest of her party then comes there. They mention that they have sent off the retreating survivors, and they have also taken care of the minor grunts. Eo then asks her to prove her worth as a hero, and the goddess notices that her humans are at a disadvantage. The heroes she sent are in an unfavorable situation, and she finds Makoto. Meanwhile the night turns to day while Hibiki and the others fight Eo, and we see that they are all exhausted while Eo is still fine. Hibiki still fights Eo, but Eo manages to hit her back, and she thinks that it's futile. They lack the strength to defeat this monster, and Rona then asks Sophia how things are on her side. Sophia mentions that she is prepared, and Mitsuruji notices the goddess's light near them. The others also notice this, and this gives Hibiki some hope. She asks everyone to hang in there, as the goddess hasn't abandoned them, and meanwhile Makoto faces off against Sophia in battle. Hibiki and the others also continue to fight and we see that now they can barely stand even with the help of their support spell. Naval then asks Woody to use that support item, and she mentions that they can't lose the hero here. She mentions that they also can't lose Chia and the rest of them, and Woody hesitates to use that item, but Naval manages to convince him. Naval then retreats for a bit, and she asks the others to cover for her, and Woody tells Chia to cast a powerful support spell on Naval, and he empowers her sword with a talisman. He also gives her the rose sign, and after using it a rose tattoo appears on her neck. Naval then fights Eo, and she manages to shatter his armor and injure him in an instant. Hibiki wonders what kind of spell Naval just used, and Naval mentions that she just used a special medium. She asks Hibiki to cover for her, and Norse notices the rose tattoo on her. Naval then manages to cut one of Eo's arms, and she doesn't give him enough time to heal. Eo is surprised that there is a spell like this in the human world, and Naval mentions that she is also surprised that Eo can fight her in this form. Eo mentions that he is the strongest demon general in terms of combat strength, and Naval then tries to go for his head while the others support her. She manages to injure him, but Eo unleashes his second form, and this heals him. Naval then gives Woody the signal to retreat, and Woody uses his high-speed movements to get everyone, but her out of there. Hibiki tells him to get Naval as well, but seeing the look on Naval's face, she realizes what's going on. She still tries to go to her, but Norse stops her, 
and he tells her that Nabal has already activated the rose sign. She has acquired power beyond her limits, but the cost is her life force. We then see that the rose sign has started to take its toll on Nabal, and EO states that Nabal is not in a state to fight. Nabal mentions that she still hasn't shown her full power, and she mentions that she used to be a woman who only killed in battles, but she found comrades who treated her like family, and friends to whom she could entrust her life. She mentions that if it's her fate to die a brutal death, then she at least wants to choose the time and place, and she mentions that she is going to die a meaningful death. She then attacks Eo, and she detonates herself in an attempt to take Eo out with her. She thinks that she had a great time with Hibiki and she perishes. Hibiki cries seeing the explosion from her direction, and the scene cuts to Tomoki wondering if he should have stayed with Hibiki. Lily tells him that he made the right call, as it's necessary for the hero to survive, and Tomoki thinks that Lily has a point and he hugs her. He mentions that he is going to become stronger, so he can fight even without the hero's blessing. Lily tells him that she will always stay by his side, and we see that Nabal's attack did manage to injure Io, but he survived. Rona then tells him that Sophia has been defeated, and she mentions that it was probably by the person who came enveloped in the golden light. We then see Mio and Tomoe healing Makoto after his fight with Sophia, and Tomoe asks Mio to ease up on her healing where she is going to lose her arm. Mio mentions that she doesn't care, and we are told that at this time Makoto knew nothing about the hero who ended this war, or how his followers saved him, and back in the present we see that Makoto has finally reached the academy. The scene then cuts to Mio and Tomoe leaving on journeys of their own, and Mio wishes that she could talk to Makoto. Tomoe wonders if she wanted to surprise him with the results of her culinary discovery, and she asks Mio where she is heading. Mio states that she is going to a port town called Karan, and she wants to find seaweed and kelp there, as they are commonly used in the Japanese-style cooking that their young master likes. Mio wonders if Tomoe is going to investigate the place where the young master fought the dragon slayer, and Tomoe states that she is, as a giant lake appeared after the fight, and she wants to know why. Mio thinks that they are really lonely right now, and Tomoe mentions that this won't be the case for too long. She states that she received word from Shiki that the young master has reached the town of Rostgard, and he should return to the demiplane once he has settled down. Afterwards we see Makoto and Shiki in the town of Rostgard, and Makoto notices that there are a variety of stores and products here. They then notice that a girl is being bullied by some guys, and Makoto thinks that someone in this situation would have an expression like this, but the look in this girl's eyes indicates that she has given up, and she doesn't care about anything. Makoto gets concerned seeing this, and he tries to tell the boys to stop, but due to his inability to communicate with humans, they don't even notice him. Makoto then tells Shiki to stop them, and Shiki asks them what they think they are doing. The guys ask them if they can't see the uniform they are wearing, and Makoto thinks that this is the uniform of Rostgard Academy. He thinks that if Tomoe and Mio were here they would totally suggest killing these guys, but Shiki would never do this. Shiki then asks Makoto if he can kill them, as they called him a fool, and they insulted his master as well. Makoto tells him that they can't simply kill people, and Shiki wonders if Makoto wants to torture them first. Makoto tells him that he wants him to convince them to leave, and Shiki asks the guys to leave before he kills them. Hearing this the guys take out their wands, and they use wind magic to start levitating. Makoto asks them if they are not going to attack, and the guys are surprised to hear this, probably because this is the only type of magic they know. Shiki then uses his earth magic to lift them up, and Makoto uses his magic counter spell to dispel the earth magic. He thinks that the guys should be fine as they are levitating, and Makoto then tells the girl to leave if she is not injured, and the girl mentions that she didn't ask to be saved. Makoto states that she can just forget about this, and he mentions that she doesn't have to feel like she owes him any favors. The girl then tells Makoto that she waits tables at the Five Irons restaurant, and she will repay his kindness if he goes there, as they serve great hot pots. Makoto tells Shiki that they should check it out later, and he then notices that the guys are still levitating in the air. Shiki mentions that they should leave them like this, and they will fall when they run out of mana. Makoto tells Shiki to save them, and Shiki uses his wind magic to do so, but he makes them fall. Makoto thinks that Shiki should grow up, and the guys then run away after telling Makoto and Shiki that they are going to make them pay. Shiki then tells Makoto that it's impossible to stop this kind of thing from happening, and they should not get involved in this. Makoto mentions that he knows this, 
but the look in that girl's eye was concerning. Shiki apologizes for speaking out of turn, and Makoto states that for now they should find an inn. He mentions that the entrance exam is three days from now, and Shiki asks him if he will be taking the exam. Makoto states that in order for him to be recognized as a local resident and get a permit to set up a store, he will have to make it to the academy. Shiki then tells Makoto that he is not actually taking the entrance exam, but the lecturer qualification exam. Makoto wonders what that is, and Shiki tells him that it's an exam to become a teacher. The documents he got from Rembrandt clearly states that it's the lecturer qualification exam, and the scene cuts to Rembrandt thinking that Makoto must have made it to Rostgard by now. He then notices that Morris is having trouble reading some small writings, and he wonders if he is suffering from presbyopia. Morris thinks that he is having no problem reading things that he is used to, and Rembrandt mentions that they should get Morris some prescription glasses, or he might make mistakes in the documents. The scene then cuts to the day of the lecturer qualification examination, and Makoto thinks that he would have run away if Rembrandt didn't make a recommendation for him. Afterwards one of the academy's staff states that he will explain the rules of the examination to Makoto, but before he begins Makoto asks him if there are any other job vacancies in this institute besides that of a teacher. The staff gets annoyed after hearing this, and he mentions that Makoto is not the first person to ask this, and he gives him an earful. This makes Shiki angry, and he sucks the life force out of the staff. Makoto stops Shiki before he does anything too drastic, and he apologizes on behalf of Shiki. Shiki is still angry at the staff for insulting Makoto, and a woman then comes there, and she apologizes on behalf of the staff. She states that badmouthing and complaining about examinees is strictly prohibited here, and their staff made a mistake, even if the applicant didn't choose the right time for inquiring about job openings. Shiki mentions that his master was just inquiring before his interview, and the woman then checks Makoto's documents before the exam. She notices that he excels in all combat techniques, and she asks him if he wants to give priority to the written or practical exam. She notices that he also has a letter of recommendation from Rembrandt Trading Company, and she thinks that he must be quite accomplished. She asks him what he is going to choose, and Shiki chooses the practical-only exam for Makoto. He mentions that this is the most difficult one out of all, and only a handful of people have managed to pass it, and Makoto was surprised to hear this. The scene then cuts to the examiner explaining the rules of the exam, and he mentions that this exam is going to last for three days. He states that every examinee must have received two items. One of them is a feather, and they can use it to return here from the exam venue. The other item is a bell which they can use to forfeit. He mentions that the examinees are not allowed to battle each other, but that said, they will probably be assigned to locations far away from each other, so there is little chance of them running into each other. He states that they can borrow any weapon they like, but they will have to make their own food. He asks them to be careful as monsters also inhabit the area, and he mentions that to pass the exam, they will have to collect three high-speed balls within three days, and bring them back to the academy. Makoto thinks that this sounds simple, and the examiner mentions that the details of how to capture the balls are written in the manual given to them. The scene then cuts to Makoto at the exam venue, and he uses Perception Kai to notice that this area has plenty of food and water, and compared to the wilderness he was first summoned to, this is a paradise. He notices that the other examinees are far away from here, and he finds a red ball. He reads the manual and he finds out that the balls will stop moving after taking enough damage, but they have to be attacked by the designated methods. If not then they will crack, and he reads that the red balls can only receive physical damage. He then punches the ball, but it breaks. Makoto is surprised to see this, and he wonders if he got the color wrong. He then notices a yellow ball which can only receive damage by magic. He uses a brid to attack it, but the yellow ball breaks as well. He then notices a blue ball, which can only receive damage from ranged attacks, and he uses a bow to damage it, but the blue ball breaks as well. Afterwards he wonders if the damage exceeded its limits, and he thinks that he should disable the boosting spell that he always casts on himself. Even after undoing the spell the balls break as soon as he touches them, and the first day ends without him making any progress at all. He then erects a barrier that causes pain when touched, and he goes to sleep. The next morning, he notices a bunch of defeated monsters outside the barrier, and after dealing with them he checks up on what the other examinees are doing. He notices that the elf is not here anymore, 
and he wonders if they have already finished. Makoto then tries to get a blue ball, and he tries to hit it with just the fletching of the arrow. He succeeds to hit it like that, but the ball teleports. He locates it, and he hits it with the fletching once more, and this stops the ball from moving. Makoto is happy to finally get one of the balls, and he notices that the human is also gone now. He wonders if they passed where they dropped out, and he then locates a yellow ball. To capture it he weakens himself with his kai, and he fires the weakest brid he can. This stops the yellow ball from moving, and he thinks that at this rate he can make it, as he still has one day left. He then eats some food, and he notices that someone new has appeared in the area this time. He wonders if examinees can enter partway through the test, and he thinks that it's fine as long as they don't bother him. The next morning Makoto notices a suspicious-looking guy among the monsters who have fallen victim to his barrier, and the assassin attacks him with some knives. Makoto blocks, and the assassin uses a spell to hide his presence. Makoto can still sense him because of his kai, and he tries to gain some distance, but the assassin stops him by grabbing his clothes, and he tries to attack him with a knife. Makoto breaks the knife using his bare hands, and the assassin backs off. Makoto then notices that the knife had poison in it, and he asks the assassin if he is targeting the examinees. The assassin states that he is, and he mentions that the others have already left. He states that he wasn't too enthusiastic about this job, but Makoto was going to pay for breaking his knife. He mentions that Makoto was going to die in a few seconds, as his knife was coated with a fast-acting poison, but he notices that nothing is happening to Makoto. He wonders if Makoto has neutralized the poison, and Makoto mentions that he can tell him how he did this, if he tells him about the person who hired him. The assassin mentions that he doesn't know the client, as he accepted the job from the assassin's guild, and Makoto thinks that he shouldn't pry further. The assassin then notices that he can't move, and Makoto tells him that he has temporarily paralyzed him from the neck down. He then informs the assassin that he is immune to poisons, and he kicks him away. Afterwards we see that the day is almost over and Makoto hasn't been able to catch a single red ball. He thinks that he can't use pure physical strength because his body constantly emits mana, and even the bow he got from the academy is a magical item. He then remembers that the knife that he got for cooking is not a magic item, and he manages to capture a red ball using it. He then returns to the exam hall, and he notices that the others are already here. He shows the balls to the examiner, and the examiner can't believe that he gathered three balls of different colors. He mentions that normally people gather three balls of the color susceptible to their best attack, but he brought back one of each. He mentions that no one has ever passed this exam like this, and the scene then cuts to Makoto at the inn. He tells Shiki that he has been hired as a temporary instructor, but he still has some time until the next step in the process, so they should go and check out that hot pot restaurant. Shiki mentions that he will look forward to it, and we then see the examiner from before whining in a bar. He mentions that no one was supposed to pass the test this time, and a girl asks him what he means. The examiner mentions that someone said that they have enough practical skill teachers, so they wanted to increase the difficulty of the exam, but he still managed to gather three balls of different colors, and the girl thinks that this is interesting. The scene then cuts to Makoto securing a permit to open a local store in Rostgard, and we find out that he recently received a notice informing him about his official employment as a lecturer. Shiki mentions that the notice came really suddenly, and Makoto states that the registration time is this afternoon. He mentions that they can head there after lunch, and they go to the Five Irons. Luria welcomes them, and she thanks them for their frequent patronage. She wonders if they are having hot pots today as well, and Shiki states that they are. Makoto asks her to prepare a chicken hotpot for him, and Luria thinks that the two of them are a rare bunch, as people usually share one hotpot. Makoto then explains that they have been coming here for five days now, and Shiki is addicted to this particular delicacy. We see that one of the students from earlier named Ilungand is watching Makoto, and he wonders why the two of them keep visiting Luria. A female student from the academy then approaches Ilungand, and she mentions that she has some things to discuss with him. The scene then cuts to Luria serving Makoto's group their hot pots, and Makoto mentions that Shiki is addicted to the creamy hot pot which he doesn't like at all. Luria then asks Makoto if he is going to teach at the academy, and she tries to tell him that she knows someone there, but another waitress summons her for some work, and she leaves. The scene then cuts to Makoto at the academy, 
and one of the staff informs him that Makoto has to follow certain rules if he wants to work here. She mentions that his business won't be a problem as long as it doesn't involve monetary transactions in school, and she states that the wages of a teacher is determined by the number of students they teach, and they get 10 silver coins for each student they teach. She mentions that as a part-time teacher Makoto can have a maximum of 30 students, and she asks him to start his first lesson next week. Makoto understands, and he states that he would like to start a class with 10 students. The staff member is surprised to hear this, as most teachers try to take in as many students as they can, and Makoto mentions that he would like to focus on the quality of teaching. A full-time lecturer named Blight then comes there, and he talks to Makoto. He finds out that Makoto wants to focus on teaching practical skills, and Blight mentions that he will send 10 students who are interested in the subject to Makoto's class. Makoto thanks him, and Blight mentions that the students this year are excellent, and some of them can even use levitation spells and telepathy. Makoto then remembers the students from earlier, and he wonders if they are considered excellent. Blight mentions that he heard how powerful Makoto is, and he states that he will look forward to seeing him in action. The scene then cuts to Makoto in the library, and the librarian wonders if she can help him. Makoto mentions that his assistant is applying for a faculty usage permit, so he came here to search for some materials for his class. The librarian asks him what books he is looking for, and Makoto asks her if she has any books on magic spells. The librarian mentions that this kind of stuff would be below Makoto's level, and Makoto puts up a barrier and he wonders how she knows his name. The librarian states that it's her duty to know his name, and Makoto mentions that he can't believe this, as there are over a hundred lecturers in this academy. The librarian then mentions that she heard about him when she was dining with the examiner, and she states that Luria of the Five Irons is also her younger sister. She told him about a pair of customers who always ordered two sets of hot pots, and Makoto thinks that this must be the person Luria wanted to tell him about. The librarian then introduces herself as Eva, and Makoto thinks that he feels like there is something sinister behind her smile, and she reminds him of Mio. The scene then cuts to Mio at the port town of Karan, and we see that she is learning how to cut vegetables from a girl named Beretta. Beretta teaches her the basics, and she shows her how to peel a radish. Mio is surprised to see how adept she is at doing this, and Beretta mentions that this technique is called Katsuramuki, and Mio thinks that this technique might be applied in areas beyond cooking. A week then passes by, and we see some students heading to attend Makoto's class. They wonder how their teacher is going to be, and they are a little concerned. They think that they are the students of Professor Blight, and simply attending the class would be enough for them. We see that Makoto is using his investigative kai to listen to all this, and he thinks that they are totally looking down on him. Shiki states that Makoto should let him be the mean face in the class, and Makoto mentions that the students would just look down on him if he is too kind. He states that he will do his best to be the mean teacher, and the students then arrive there. Shiki and Makoto introduce themselves to them, and the students think that Makoto looks like a kobold. Makoto tells them that he will provide them a thorough lesson with focus on magic, and he asks one of the students what elements he can command. The student states that he has an affinity with wind, and Makoto asks him about his other element. The student mentions that he knows some earth and fire magic, and he asks the same question to another student. She states that she can use fire and wind magic, and Makoto asks them how many of them can command multiple elements with the same level of mastery. The students fall silent, and Makoto thinks that he will do what Tomoe did. He mentions that he now has a good understanding of their strengths, and he states that they will remain a bunch of third rates unless they improve. One of the girls mentions that he is going too far, and she states that they were accepted in this academy because they are qualified. Makoto mentions that he is only stating the facts, and another student states that when it comes to magic, it's natural to choose an element and master it. Makoto mentions that they will be torn apart on the battlefield if the enemy sees through their only element, and he states that they must at least master three different elements. The students mention that this sounds simple, but they wonder if Makoto can do this himself. Makoto states that he will conduct a mock battle with Shiki to show them what they are capable of, and the two of them take positions to fight. The students notice that they can't feel any magic energy coming from Makoto, but they can feel immense power from Shiki's staff. Shiki then attacks Makoto using his staff with high speed, but Makoto manages to block everything using his barrier. 
Makoto talks to Shiki telepathically and he mentions that he has come a long way. Shiki states that it's because Mio and Tomoe have been training him, and Makoto then attacks him with a fire spell. Shiki manages to block with a barrier, and he then uses an earth spell to attack Makoto, but Makoto dodges, and he destroys the spell with a fire arrow. The students are surprised to see all this, and Makoto uses fire and water at the same time to attack Shiki, but Shiki manages to parry the attack. He states that it's all thanks to the staff that the elder dwarves made for him, and Makoto tells him that they can't let this battle go on forever. He mentions that they should finish it with their next move, and they both begin chanting spells. The students think that this is the first time the two of them are chanting, and they wonder how much stronger their spells are going to be now. They notice that Makoto can actually speak, and the spells of Makoto and Shiki then clash. After the dust settles down, we see that Shiki has lost, and Makoto notices that everyone is dumbfounded after their display of power. He thinks that everyone might quit this class, and he states that this will be all for today, and he asks them to decide if they want to continue attending his class. He then leaves after telepathically telling Shiki to heal the girl who was injured because of some debris, and Shiki thinks that he couldn't even land a hit on Makoto. The girls then think that they can't stay in this class, but the boys are ecstatic and scared at the same time, and they think that they might get stronger if they learn from Makoto. Shiki then heals the girl who was injured by applying some ointment, and the ointment works fast, and seeing this the girl thinks that it must have cost a fortune. Shiki states that there is no need to worry as they have plenty of it in their shop, and the girl is completely taken in by his good looks. Shiki then leaves, and afterwards Makoto wonders if anyone will stay for his next lesson. Shiki states that at least half of them are going to stay, and Makoto thinks that he can't change the expression on his face, and he thinks that he should avoid imitating Tomoe too much. The scene then cuts to Tomoe near the Star Lake, and she talks to a wounded soldier who witnessed the war between the demons and humans. After talking to him she finds out that the lake created during that battle is now called Star Lake, and she looks into the man's memories to find out how this lake was created. She finds out that the lake was created as a result of one of Makoto's attacks, and she thinks that the young master never ceases to amuse her. The scene then cuts to Makoto teaching his next class, and he notices that out of the ten students he got, five are still remaining. One of the students then introduce themselves as Jean Rowan, and Makoto states that he wants to be a swordsman, and he is one of the top students according to practical tests. Another student introduces himself as Izumo Kuasekabe, and Makoto mentions that he wants to be a mage, and since his name sounds Japanese, he must be from the Laurel Commonwealth. The girl introduces herself as Abelia Hopleys, and Makoto thinks that there is another Hopleys in this school, and he is the son of a great aristocrat in Limia. Another guy introduces himself as Dina Severus, and Makoto mentions that this kid is married, and his wife is on leave because she is going into labor. The last one introduces himself as Mitra Casper, and Makoto states that he was born and raised in Rostgard, and his parents are both clerics. Izumo then asks Makoto why he talks using magic when he can speak, as he did chant a spell yesterday. Makoto states that he can't speak the common tongue due to some reason, and he starts the class. He asks everyone about the effects of mana depletion on the body, and the students mention that when half of the mana is depleted, there will be mental and physical fatigue, and when it's down to 20% the body would be unable to move. When all of the mana is depleted, the person will vomit, become confused, and pass out and when it's depleted beyond the person's limit, then they could die. Dina states that they learned this in elementary school, and Makoto tells them that they need to know their limits through actual combat. He states that they should be ready to have injuries, and he mentions that there is no need to worry as he has plenty of medicines to replenish their mana and stamina. The scene then cuts to the students all exhausted after fighting Makoto, and we see that only Jean and Mitra are standing until the end. Mitra then uses his healing magic to strengthen Jean, and Jean tries to attack Makoto, but Makoto takes him down easily. After everyone is down, Makoto gives them some stamina and magic potions, and he states that it's meaningless to know that they have limits until they experience it firsthand. He asks them to reflect on their actions, and submit a report to him, and the scene then cuts to Ilungan winning a mock battle. He remembers that the girl from the academy gave him some pills that can boost his physical and magical powers, and she told him that this is something that the academy is currently developing. The scene then cuts to Ilungan walking down the academy's hallway with the pills, and he notices Makoto. He wonders what Makoto was doing here, and he wonders if he is a lecturer here. 
The scene then cuts to Makoto reviewing the reports of the students, and he thinks that they all have potential. He thinks that Jean has really good stamina, and he also checked on the movements of others, and he has what it takes to be a leader. Shiki thinks that his observations are astute, and Makoto mentions that he is not used to being a teacher but he will do his best. Elsewhere we see that Blight was the one who ordered the assassin to kill Makoto, and he can't believe that the assassin guild couldn't even assassinate a single person. The assassin mentions that Makoto was abnormally strong, and he even managed to break his knife which was made from the reversed scale of the great dragon. Blight asks him to spare the excuses, and kill that part-time lecturer as soon as possible. It's been two weeks since Makoto became a lecturer, and a new store outside of Sige has been opened. We see that Makoto has brought the ogre sisters named Aris and Aqua to work here, and he shows them the merchandise he has in this store. He tells them that this store is going to stay open until midnight, and this will help them build their reputation. The girls are terrified to hear that they have to work till that late, and Makoto states that they shouldn't worry as they are going to work in shifts and they will be able to take breaks. They will also get a food allowance, and they will have a nice manager like Shiki. He mentions that since it's a new store, it shouldn't get that busy, and this means that this store will be much easier to manage than the one in Sige. The girls think that this is great, and Makoto isn't sure if they can handle the store by themselves. The scene then cuts to Makoto in the academy's library, and he has an exhausted look on his face. He thinks that both his classes and business is going well, but lately girls have been asking to marry him. They are overlooking his face for his money, and they want to be his third wife, so they can be free from any duty. Makoto wonders if this can even be considered a marriage, and he looks at the drawing of his parents. Eva asks him who these people are, and Makoto mentions that they are kind people who took care of him. They were very close to him, and remembering them makes him think that the people here have a weird concept about marriage. Eva explains that many students here are children of aristocrats and merchants, and they are used to marriages of convenience. Makoto thinks that they are too young to even consider marriage, and Eva states that Makoto is really pure. Makoto then thinks that he is starting to feel like Tomoe and Mio were better than these girls as they didn't befriend him for his money. The scene then cuts to Tomoe near the Star Lake, and Lime reports to her that before the battle at Stellar Fort, someone was engaged in combat with Waterfall Laika. It was probably Sophia, and he wonders if Tomoe has found a lead about the ring that seals the power of the goddess. Tomoe mentions that she couldn't find anything regarding that, but she did find out who created the Star Lake. Lime states that this is obvious, as the young master is the only one capable of such a feat, and Tomoe then notices that Lime was tailed, and someone is outside their camp. Tomoe asks who it is, and they mention that they are just a group of travelers, and they heard that they could procure rare and fine weapons here. Tomoe allows them to enter the house, and we see that the travelers are Tomoki, Lily and Mora. Tomoe introduces herself and Lime to them, and she mentions that they work as guards for the Kuzunoha company at the border. Tomoki then notices that Tomoe has a fine inventory of weapons, and she also seems strong, and he asks her how old she is. Tomoe mentions that it's not nice to ask a lady her age, before introducing themselves. Tomoki's party then introduces themselves, and Lime figures out that they are the hero, and the second princess of Gritonia. Tomoe asks them what brings them here as they seem like knights and aristocrats from another kingdom, and Lily mentions that they are here to investigate the lake that appeared out of nowhere. Tomoki then asks Tomoe to let him have a look at the katana she has, and Tomoe gives it to him, but Tomoki can't draw the katana. Tomoe tells him that a spell was cast on this katana, and she is the only one who can draw it. Tomoki mentions that it's impossible, as he has the power to wield any weapon in this world, and Tomoe asks him to not be so rough with it. She takes the katana back, and she shows Tomoki how it looks, as he seems interested in it. Tomoki and the others are surprised to see how good the sword is, and afterwards Tomoe states that they are busy so Tomoki's group should leave. Lily then mentions that she would like to purchase that katana, but Tomoe tells them that she is the only one who can wield it. Lily then announces to them, the real identity of their group, and she asks Tomoe to lend her strength to them for the sake of the world. Tomoe mentions that she thinks that they need the katana for a different agenda, and they might be planning to use it as a reference to develop their own weapons. She mentions that she is never going to sell her katana, and this is the end of their conversation. Tomoki then uses his magic eye on Lime, 
and Lime tries to convince Tomoe to allow him to give his katana to the hero. Tomoe tells him to shut up, and she mentions that her subordinate seems to be acting strange today. Tomoki then uses his magic eye on Tomoe and he asks her to join their cause of saving the world, but the magic eye has no effect on her. Tomoe tells him to stop giving her that disgusting look, and she wonders if Tomoki is a pervert, as he has been ogling her for a while. She thinks that he is a letdown for a hero, and she refuses Tomoki's offer of joining him, and she tells him that she is already devoting her heart and soul to her master. Tomoki is surprised that the magic eye didn't work on her, and Mora asks Tomoe if she is a dragon. She mentions that Tomoe is no ordinary dragon, as she has pure strength and aura, and Lily wonders if she is the waterfall Laika, as that's the strongest dragon in the area. Tomoe states that she is not Laika, and Lily can't believe that Tomoe just read her mind. Mora then tries to use her dragon summoner powers to take control of Tomoe, but it doesn't work, and Tomoe uses her aura to dispel her powers. This also dispels the effect of Tomoki's magic eye on Lime, and he wonders why he was trying to hand his katana to someone like him. This makes the hero angry, and he attacks Lime. Tomoe states that the hero is acting like a kid, and she mentions that he is just a hopeless scoundrel. She fades away into a mist, and she states that they should pretend like this meeting never happened. She mentions that if they try to brew any silly plans, then the hero from the empire will soon perish, and Tomoe then disappears with the mist. Tomoki then thinks that Tomoe seems like a rare character of the highest level, and he states that he wants to make her his. Elsewhere we see Tomoe and Lime, and Lime can't believe that he was about to hand over his precious katana to that pretentious brat. Tomoe then asks Lime if he wants to become her servant, and Lime agrees without any hesitation. He states that he is happy to become stronger at his own pace, but he doesn't want to regret lacking strength when it matters the most, and he starts his training with Tomoe. The scene then cuts to Mio looking for some seaweeds, and she notices that they are delicious, and they don't even seem poisonous. Habiki's wolf then attacks her, and it pushes her into the sea, and Mio gets mad at it for drenching her kimono. She tries to end it, but Habiki saves it, and she apologizes to Mio before she could do anything drastic. Mio notices that this human is more concerned about her well-being rather than her own life, and Habiki mentions that she will make sure that her pet repents. She then returns her pet to Orobi, and Mio wonders if that was a spirit. Habiki states that it was some kind of guardian beast, and seeing her weird smile reminds Mio of Makoto. Habiki then asks Mio if she is alright, and Mio mentions that she is fine, as the wolf only left some marks on her kimono. Habiki asks her if she can make it up to her somehow, and Mio wonders if Habiki can help her select the best pieces of seaweeds from that pile. Mio notices that Habiki knows how to differentiate between seaweeds and kelp, and Habiki mentions that they can make great miso soup out of these. Mio gets excited knowing that Habiki might know how to prepare that dish, and the scene cuts to her traveling with the hero's party two days later. Mio finds out that they are on their way to acquire weapons in Sige, and she talks with Habiki about cooking. Woody then thinks that Hibiki seems to be acting tough, but her emotional scars are deeper than anyone else. She has been hiding her identity in her travels, thinking that it will lift her spirits, but it won't be easy for her to heal. Mio then asks them if they are strong, and Hibiki mentions that she is a decent fighter. Mio thinks that in this case she can leave the rare creature heading their way to them, and a giant mantis-like monster then comes there. Habiki's party tries to fight it, and Mio thinks that they are not that bad, but they are poorly equipped. Norst wonders why they had to encounter this thing before resupplying in Sige, and he thinks that he will have to support Habiki in Navel's place. He tries to fight the mantis head-on, but the mantis attacks and injures him, and the others ask for Habiki's orders. Habiki gets scared seeing her wounded party member, and it reminds her of Navel's death. She asks Mio for help, and Mio defeats the mantis by cutting it in half. This surprises the others, and she asks them if Norst is alright. They mention that his injuries aren't life-threatening, and we see that the mantis can still move, and it lands a surprise attack on Mio. This ruins her kimono, and she gets mad at the mantis, as Makoto complimented how good she looked in this kimono. She then destroys the monsters in utter rage, and Habiki's party is amazed to see her power. Mio then hopes that her kimono can be mended, and the miasma from her attack then knocks out Hibiki and her party. The wolf then comes out and it tries to protect Hibiki, 
and Mio thinks that the two of them must have met before, and this is why the wolf is wary of her. She tells the wolf that she has changed now, and she has no intention of harming its master, and the wolf calms down. The scene then cuts to Habiki remembering Navel, and she wakes up in an inn. She finds a note from Mio, and it tells her that Mio has brought her and her friends to Sige, and she asks them to seek out the Kuzunoha Trading Company. The scene then cuts to Habiki at the Kuzunoha Trading Company with her party, and she meets Mio. Habiki asks her if her kimono is going to be alright, and Mio mentions that she will have it mended. Habiki wonders if Mio invited her to criticize her for letting her deal with that monster, but Mio tells her that she invited her over to cook. She mentions that Habiki can repay her for saving her life by giving her a bit of her time, and Habiki can't believe that this is all she wants. Woody then tells Mio that they came to see Gay to acquire new equipment and train in the wastelands, and they don't have much time. Mio mentions that it would be pointless for a party that struggled against that monster to head into the wastelands, and Habiki states that regardless of this, they have to get stronger. Burin then suggests that he will make the equipment they need to fight in the wastelands, and they can pay for it later. During the three days it will take him to create the equipment, and until they are training here, he wants them to teach Mio how to cook. Mio mentions that new equipment won't guarantee their survival, and if they die, she can't learn how to cook that soup, and Habiki can't believe that Mio is more worried about her cooking than their life. Burin then mentions that Mio should have Toa and her party accompany them in this case, and Mio thinks that this is a great idea. Burin asks Habiki and her party what they think, and Habiki mentions that she appreciates the offer. The scene then cuts to Mio cooking some food, a few days later, and we see that she has gotten better at peeling the vegetables and evaluating the ingredients, but her sense of taste is horrible. Habiki then tells Mio that over the few days she has learned that Mio has a high tolerance for unsavory food, but she is also sensitive to tasty food. She states that if Mio can learn to distinguish between the two, then there is still hope for her, and she mentions that they should start by mastering this. The scene then cuts to Makoto and Shiki having some hot pot, and Shiki mentions that Tomoe has asked them to return to the demiplane as she has much to report to Makoto. Makoto thinks that they have only been communicating telepathically lately, and Shiki mentions that they should return to the demiplane, as the forest ogres will be able to handle the shop here. Makoto thinks that he is a little worried, but he mentions that he will trust Shiki, and he returns to the demiplane. He notices that it's really hot in the demiplane, and Shiki tells him that the irregular changes in weather patterns have gotten worse. Makoto wonders what has happened to his once cozy demiplane, and he notices that his house is finally complete. Inside the house he is welcomed by the residents of the demiplane including Mio and Tomoe, and Makoto thanks everyone for the hard work they have done all this time, and he makes a toast. They all then have some food, and Emma tells Makoto that everyone here missed him. She mentions that he should come back more often, and Makoto states that he will keep that in mind. Mio then serves some soup to Makoto, and he likes the taste. Mio cries with happiness after seeing this, and Tomoe tells Makoto that Mio made this soup herself. She explains that Mio was on a journey to hone her cooking until recently, and all the food in today's party was prepared by her. Makoto commends her on a job well done, and Mio mentions that she has come to understand the joy of cooking. She states that she will prepare something even more delicious the next time, and she leaves for Sige. Emma explains to Makoto that an adventurer in Sige is teaching her how to cook, and Tomoe then tells him that they have a meeting after some time, and until then he should get some rest. The scene then cuts to Makoto having a meeting with Tomoe and Mio, and Tomoe mentions that she has investigated the area where Makoto and the Dragon Slayer fought. She mentions that she also ran into the hero's party, and it was the hero of Gritonia. His name was Tomoki Iwahashi, and judging from his looks, he was around the same age as Makoto. Makoto asks her what she thinks about him, and Tomoe mentions that she felt like he was up to no good. He seemed like a scum, and he was obsessed with his power, and his desires got the better of him. After defeating the demons, he will most likely wage war on the humans, and she mentions that she also read the princess's thoughts, and she found out that the princess knew about the weapon known as a gun. Shiki thinks that the hero must have told her about it, and Makoto thinks that a gun isn't as powerful as magic spells, but a small one can be used for assassinations. Depending on the situation it can be used for genocide, and Tomoe mentions that she finds both of them repulsive. She thought about killing them both without telling Makoto, 
and Makoto mentions that Tomoe shouldn't kill people so easily. Tomoe then states that she didn't obtain any useful information about the goddess's power and the dragon slayer, and Makoto wonders if she found something about him. Tomoe mentions that she didn't find anything unusual, and she states that all she knows is that someone released an arrow on the battlefield and created a lake. Makoto wonders if this was done by that no-good goddess, and Tomoe mentions that the survivors referred to the culprit as a devil, but Makoto doesn't realize that she is talking about him. He states that it's their turn to share information now, and Tomoe mentions that she already got a general idea about the academy from Shiki. She mentions that she heard that Makoto was really popular among the girls, and she asks him all the details. Makoto states that this shouldn't be necessary as Shiki has already told her everything, and he mentions that the heat here is really unbearable. The three of them then go out, and Makoto wonders what could be causing this irregular weather. He finds out that he is the reason this is happening, and Tomoe explains that it's because of the misty door that he set up outside. Makoto states that he sets up a door wherever he goes, and Tomoe mentions that the weather inside here is determined by the last location where Makoto used the door. Makoto states that the weather at the academy is really nice, and Shiki mentions that it must not be a direct reflection of the door's location. The terrain and landscape might affect it as well, and Tomoe states that she will keep investigating this, and Makoto thinks that after knowing this he won't ever be able to travel with an ease of mind. The scene then cuts to Mio finding out that Hibiki and her party have to return to Limia, as they have been ordered to do so, and Mio is sad as she won't be able to learn any more new dishes. Hibiki apologizes for this, and she mentions that there is something that she must do. Mio states that it can't be helped if this is the case, and Hibiki mentions that the conditions in the wastelands are harsher than they expected, and they couldn't have survived their journey if they didn't meet her. She thanks her for this, and the sword that Burin made for her, and Mio mentions that she was glad to help. Hibiki then asks Mio if she can come with her, but Mio states that she wants to stay by her young master's side. Hibiki tries to convince her, but she refuses to go. She mentions that she doesn't plan to serve anyone other than the young master, and she tells Hibiki to stay safe on her journey. Hibiki then asks Mio to come by Limia if she ever has a chance, and she will teach her some new recipes. Mio is happy to hear this, and the two of them part ways. The scene then cuts to Makoto checking out the fields in the demi-plane, and Emma tells him that their harvest has become more plentiful. They have improved their farmland based on Shiki's instructions, and they get to harvest the produce every two weeks now. Makoto thinks that the results are over the top, and he tells Shiki that this is impressive. Shiki mentions that the technique is based on the knowledge that he received from Makoto, and Makoto thinks that they won't have to worry about food shortages now. He mentions that he is worried about the demiplane's weather, but for now they should increase the population as planned. Emma states that they have already begun the selection process, and Tomoe, Mio, and Shiki have each recommended a species. Makoto mentions that he would like to interview them, and Emma informs him that Eld also wanted to speak to him. Eld shows him a claw, and he mentions that Mio brought this with her when her kimono was damaged the other day. Makoto is surprised that her kimono was damaged, and Eld informs him that she wasn't harmed. He mentions that the material is the problem and Makoto wonders if it's from a powerful monster. Eld states that he looked into it, and it seemed like the monster had consumed a wind spirit. It's hard to believe that such a weak monster could have preyed on a spirit, and Makoto thinks that someone must have deliberately created this monster. Shiki mentions that he was the one who made that monster, and it was one of the experiments he conducted before he met Makoto. He captured several mid-level spirits, weakened them, and fed them to monsters. He thought that they would turn into existing spirits or undergo similar changes, but he never got to see favorable results, so he abandoned them. He apologizes to Makoto, and Makoto wonders if this was the only monster he made. Shiki states that he made several, and Eld wonders if they should report this to Tomoe and Mio. Makoto mentions that they should, as Shiki deserves an earful for this mistake. The scene then cuts to Makoto heading to interview the different species, and Emma tells him that Tomoe has chosen an unusual species, while Mio chose based on instincts, and Shiki chose based on their abilities. Makoto thinks that he has a bad feeling about this, and Emma mentions that she has already invited the representatives from each race, and he is going to see them. Makoto thinks that making them come here seems kind of arrogant, and Emma tells him that it's only natural for them to send representatives since they are hoping to relocate here. 
She states that Makoto should act like the master of this place in front of them, and he should also not use honorifics while referring to her. He then meets the first group, who are Winkin recommended by Shiki. He welcomes them to the demiplane, and they thank him for considering them as new residents of this place. Makoto introduces himself to them, and the leader of the Winkin introduces himself as Kaken, and he introduces his advisor as Shona. Emma wonders how long they are planning to stay up there, and they come down at once. Makoto then notices that their species has a large population, and he thinks that it's impressive considering that they live in a place even more remote than the mountain where Tomoe lived. The Winkin then asks Makoto if it's true that he is going to treat them equally among current residents, and give them suitable jobs. Makoto states that it's true, and they are happy that they won't have to fight over resources anymore. The Winkin pass the interview, and he then meets Gorgons that were recommended by Tomoe. He asks them to remove their masks, but the Gorgons hesitate as their eyes have a petrifying effect. Makoto states that it's fine, as he is protecting himself and Emma, and the Gorgons mention that they can't sense any magic coming from him. Emma asks them to not underestimate her master, and the Gorgons remove their masks at once. They turn the table in front of them to stone, and Makoto states that these eyes must be inconvenient for them. The Gorgons mention that they are, as they even turn their food to stone, and Makoto notices that the Gorgons only have females, and there are no males among them. The Gorgons mention that they reproduce by absorbing energy from males of other species, and their children are also born as Gorgons. Makoto tells them that they won't be able to provide them with mates, so they will have to find them on their own, and the Gorgons agree to this, but they are not sure if the other residents will be able to withstand their eyes. Makoto states that they shouldn't worry about that, as he plans to create glasses that has the same effect as their masks. The Gorgons are excited to hear this, but they wonder if Makoto is sure about having them here, as they don't have the ability to reverse the things that they turn to stone. Makoto mentions that this won't be a problem and he uses his power to return the table they turn to stone into normal, and he also applies petrification resistance on the table. He states that he can do this if they turn anything to stone, and the Gorgons are glad that they won't have to wear their masks anymore. They ask Makoto to allow them to live here, and he states that he is fine with it, as long as they behave themselves, and he passes them as well. They then meet the third group called Al Almera who were recommended by Neo. Makoto refers to them as fairies, and he finds out that they are trying to leave the forest they live in because they have been found by a pack of lich. They mention that they are not fairies, and they are better than those bugs, and they sound condescending. Emma doesn't like their behavior, but Makoto asks her to calm down, as they might be able to use them for gathering information. Emma still states that she is against this, and she mentions that it would be a disaster to invite these guys into the demiplane. She mentions that Makoto should take this more seriously, as this interview will decide the future of the demiplane, and she states that if the Al Elmera are so great they should chase off the pack of liches themselves. The Al Elmera mention that Emma shouldn't talk like that as she is just a pig, and this makes her angry. The Al Elmera are rejected, and afterwards Tomoe and Shiki find out that two species have passed the interview. Shiki mentions that he will create prototype glasses and contact lenses for the Gorgons, and Tomoe states that she will look after the Winkin and come up with a training plan for them. Mio then comes there, and she brings some vegetable sticks with mayonnaise. Makoto is surprised to see the mayonnaise, and he eats some. He states that it's good, and Shiki tries some as well. He likes it as well, and he wonders if he can add mayonnaise to a hot pot. Tomoe also tries some, and she states that this is nothing compared to the miso she is working on. Mio asks her when she will be done with the miso, and Tomoe mentions that it's almost ready. Meanwhile in the Five Irons we see Makoto's students talking about two students who are coming back next week, and they are surprised that the two of them have recovered from their illness. They think that those two have terrible personalities, but their grades are good, and this only makes them worse. They have heard that the two of them have put more than a few students and some teachers out of commission, and they wonder if Makoto knows about them. They think that he probably doesn't as he is new here, and they doubt that those two will bother him, as they only go after pretty faces, and we find out that they are talking about Rembrandt's daughters. The scene cuts to Makoto noticing that it's raining in the demiplane, and Tomoe tells him that her hypothesis is mostly correct, and the misty door Makoto used last time is affecting the weather in the demiplane. Mio mentions that it's hard for her to store food in this unpredictable weather, 
and Shiki states that the people haven't been greatly affected by the weather so far, but there could be a sudden thunderstorm or a scorching hot sun. Makoto thinks that a certain level of regularity is much needed, and Tomoe states that after collecting data from Makoto's mana, she has noticed the link between the misty door and the weather, and it's mostly predictable. She states that she will go and look for spots where the four seasons can change effortlessly, and Makoto mentions that he will be counting on her, as he needs to get back to Rostgard. Neo wonders if he really has to leave, and Makoto notices that no one in the demiplane wants him to leave. He states that he will have to go, and he will try to come back as often as he can. The scene then cuts to Aris giving Makoto the money from his store, and Shiki tells him that their business has been doing well. It's time for them to hire more shopkeepers, and as a reward for working hard Makoto gives Aqua and Aris some banana, and this makes them happy. Afterwards we see Makoto at the academy, and he mentions that they need special permission for the lesson today. Shiki states that he already has the permit, and there should be no problems. Makoto then comes across Blight, and he mentions that he would like to buy 10 jars of external wound ointment that Makoto sells. He states that during the time between summer break and the school's anniversary some of his students come to class with wounds, and Makoto mentions that he will get him his order. He asks him to check out the other items at his store as well, and Blight mentions that he will come by sometimes. He then leaves, and Makoto thinks that they now have quite a reputation in the academy, and he hopes that Blight is not reselling the ointments for a profit. Makoto then notices that there are a lot of love letters in his and Shiki's desks, and Shiki mentions that he will check these out for Makoto, and he asks him to check the important documents first. Makoto then notices that three new students have applied for his class, and he is surprised to see the name of the students. The scene cuts to the new students introducing Makoto to the rest of the class, and the first one introduces herself as Sif Rembrandt, and she mentions that she was away due to a sickness. She is human, and she specializes in offensive magic. Her elements are earth and fire, and she also has the protection of earth spirits. The second one introduces herself as Yuno Rembrandt, and she states that she is Sif's younger sister, and she is also a human. She is skilled at physical combat, and she likes the position of the center of the guard rather than vanguard, and depending on the situation she can either be a lancer or an archer. Makoto is glad that the two of them have made a full recovery, and the last one introduces herself as Karen Furs. She mentions that she is a transfer student from Fusk Royal Academy, and she is a human, and she has an affinity with water. Shiki and Makoto seem suspicious of her, and Makoto tells the Rembrandt sisters that their father is a friend of his, but he won't show them any special treatment. The boys think that the Rembrandt sisters seems different from what they used to be, and they think that they might just be pretending. Shiki telepathically tells Makoto that the sisters have a bad reputation in school, and they used to be proud of their wealth and good looks. They were rude and rebellious, and Makoto thinks that he can't tell that by looking at them. He then mentions that he has prepared an interesting activity for today's class, and he asks the older students to follow him. He takes them away from the new students, and he mentions that they will be fighting an opponent that he is going to summon. The students wonder if they will be able to survive today's lesson, and they think that they don't want the new students to see how useless they are. Makoto then uses his mist gate to summon Liddy, and he secretly asks him to use only 20% of his strength, and not use his breath attack. He tells the students that they will survive if they fight hard, and he then talks to the new students. He mentions that they will be fighting him, and they will be the only ones attacking. He will tell them about the areas they need to improve in while they fight, and if they don't improve, he will start decimating their attacks the second time. Yuno then shoots Makoto, but he blocks her arrow, and he states that it's too weak. She shoots him again, but it's still the same. He asks her to infuse the arrow with mana and increase her physical strength, and Sif then attacks him with magic, and Karen freezes him, and he states that they did well. Karen has a good sense of the time gap of casting, and Sif even thought about tricking her opponent. He breaks the ice easily, and he tells Sif to have control over the intensity of battle, and raise her speed, and he tells Karen to focus on her output strength and effect duration. Yuno tries to shoot him again, but he burns away her arrow. He tells her that she is too eager to unleash a powerful shot, and this makes her shots crude. He mentions that he is going to defeat them in a way which they will never forget, and he states that it's better to experience failure early on rather than later. Meanwhile the other students are fighting Liddy, but they are no match for him, and by the end all of the students are wiped out. 
Makoto tells them that he will be ending the lesson here, and he asks them to write a report about why they failed, and submit it. He asks Karen to come with him, as he has something to discuss with her, and he leaves. We see that the students are all wiped out, and they think that Makoto is setting the bar a little too high. Shiki tells them that Makoto will never give them a goal that can't be overcome, and he may be strict, but it's only because he has high hopes for them. He states that he envies them for this, as it's been some time since he has had any expectations of him, and he asks the Rembrandt sisters if they would like to continue taking this class. They mention that they won't give up, and they will look forward to getting stronger with the rest of them. Abelia wonders if they would like to exchange thoughts about the lesson with them, and Rembrandt sisters state that they would love that. The scene then cuts to Makoto talking with Karen, and he tells her that her strength is unusual for a mere student. Karen mentions that it's understandable, as she did serve as a mage in the army, and she states that she can tell Makoto which unit she served in if he doubts her. Makoto mentions that he has already checked her background, but he doubts that she is the real Karen Furs. Karen states that of course she is real, and she wonders if Makoto would like to know her better. Makoto then asks her what a demon is doing in the academy, and Karen tries to feign ignorance, but Makoto states that he may not have any horns, but her skin and eye color does not lie. Karen then tries to use her magic eye to charm Makoto, but Makoto tells her that this is not going to work on him. Karen mentions that she didn't expect her cover to be blown so soon, and she angrily asks Makoto to not call her hornless, or she might just kill him. Makoto wonders if she has killed the real Karen, and the demon states that it was not her doing, a friend of hers got her. The demon then asks Makoto why he is not killing her at sight, as this is how most humans react and Makoto mentions that he is against any form of discrimination. Her race is of no concern to him as long as they understand each other, and Karen is surprised that he can speak the demon language. Makoto tells her that he can speak every language except for the common tongue, and he asks her what he should call her. Karen mentions that he doesn't need to know that, and she states that she needs to get rid of him now that he knows that she is a demon. Shiki then states that her name is Rona, and she is one of the four generals of the demon army. He telepathically tells Makoto that he met her when he was a lich, but she probably doesn't recognize him in this form. Makoto then states that as a merchant, information is important to him, and he has the upper hand in both information and numbers. Rona states that she is in a sticky situation, and she mentions that they should talk somewhere else. The scene then cuts to them at the Five Irons, and Rona states that she would like to know more about the Kuzunova Trading Company. She mentions that they have an outlet in Seagay as well, and she wonders if they have an intelligence agency there. Makoto tells her that they don't belong to either the human faction or the demon faction, and Rona is surprised to hear this. Makoto states that she doesn't need to be shocked as he is sure that some humans have already defected to their side, and so it shouldn't be surprising to know that some remain neutral. Rona then asks him if he is trying to be an arms dealer, and Makoto mentions that he just doesn't want anyone to get in the way of his business. Rona mentions that she still can't trust him, but she understands his intentions, and she states that they should get to know each other better. Shiki tells her that she will regret it if she ever has any bodily contact with Makoto, and Rona states that this is a shame. Makoto then asks her why she has infiltrated the academy, and Rona mentions that her goal is to investigate and take care of the secret human experiment in this city. The scene then cuts to Makoto meeting Lyme in his shop, and he tells him that he would like him to investigate something in this city. He explains that some demi-humans have been getting abducted lately, and there seem to be activities of human trafficking. The Assassin Guild is also involved in this, and he was ambushed by them once. Lime states that they are going to be a problem if that's true, and he mentions that he will do his best to find some dirt on them. Makoto asks Aqua and Eris to help Lime with this, and they hesitate to work overtime but they agree when Makoto promises to give them bananas as reward. Afterwards Shiki tells Makoto that it won't be wise for him to trust Rona's every word, and Makoto states that he knows this. He asks Shiki what's his relationship with her, and Shiki mentions that they were partners who exchanged information, but she used him and got him into all kinds of troubles. She owes a great deal to the Demon King, and she frantically pledged her loyalty to him. She is not as strong as Mio but he can think of her as a dubious version of Mio. Makoto states that this sounds scary, and he asks Shiki to monitor her actions. Afterwards he goes to pay a visit to the Rembrandt sisters, and he apologizes for not being able to visit them when they were recovering. 
They state that Makoto seems softer outside of class, and he tells them that he unknowingly gets strict in class. He asks her to keep his visit a secret from the others, and they thank him for saving their lives. They state that he can let them know if they can help him in any way, and he asks them to just live happy and fulfilling lives. He then remembers that their father was going to record their journey of recovery, and he states that he would like to see that. They mention that them and their mother made sure that he reflected on his foolish actions, and they have also punished Morris for suggesting something like this. Makoto thinks that he can see how those rumors started, and he then leaves the girls' dorms. Shiki mentions that the Rembrandt sisters aren't as bad as the rumors suggest, and he states that the curse might have changed them for the better. Makoto hopes that they can grow up well, and have a future ahead of them. Elsewhere Lime investigates the human experiments, and after some searching, he finds some new clothes in an abandoned building in the academy's compound. He senses someone there, and he points his sword at them telling them to stop there if they don't want to die. The story continues and Aqua and Eris tell Makoto that they were supposed to meet Lime at daybreak, but they can't reach him telepathically. They mention that Lime last made contact with them when he was at the development site of the school compound, and it's unnatural for him to start fighting without direct orders. Makoto thinks that even if he was ambushed, he won't be defeated so easily, and Shiki wonders if Rona has fooled them. He thinks that she would have no problem pulling something like this, and Makoto mentions that it's still too early to draw any conclusions. He states that they should check the crime scene first, and we then see Lime in a prison cell with Eva. We find out that his katana is also gone, and he apologizes for dragging Eva into this. Lime then remembers what happened, and we find out that the white-haired boy that he was fighting was too powerful, and he tried to make contact with Makoto, but the boy had blocked his telepathy. Lime then attacked the boy, and the boy sensed that someone was coming, and he left after sending Lime flying with an attack. Eva who was hiding nearby, tried to save Lime, but she was also captured along with Lime by the people who came there afterwards. Eva mentions that she didn't expect the organization to abandon her so easily, and we see that Lime knows that Eva is the academy librarian. He mentions that she should know Makoto, and he is an employee at Makoto's company. Eva thinks that he seems more like a bodyguard, and Lime mentions that it's the same thing. He then asks Eva if she wants to escape, and Eva mentions that the organization must be pretty powerful if they are able to establish a base here. She states that they must have collaborators in the academy, and as a librarian her escape won't change anything. She mentions that Lime won't be able to defeat that boy, and Lime states that the boy isn't here. He mentions that he left a mark on him when they fought earlier, and he knows his current location. Eva states that even if she believes him, it doesn't change the fact that she is in danger, and she mentions that if he is going to rescue her, he should do something about the people who have taken root in the academy. Lime wonders what's in it for him, and Eva states that she can provide his master, Makoto with useful information, and if they destroy the organization, she can reward them handsomely. Lime agrees to her offer, and he uses a magic blade from his bracelet to break free of prison. They then try to get out, and they stumble upon a room filled with human and demi-human experiments. They are both appalled to see this, and Eva states that the goal of these experiments is probably enhancing combat and magical abilities. Lime thinks that he should contact Makoto, but his telepathy still doesn't work, and he mentions that for now he will free all of these test subjects from their misery. Elsewhere we see Shiki and Makoto looking for Lime, and Shiki states that he can sense a dragon here. He mentions that they might not be dealing with demons, and Makoto thinks that it could be Mitsuruji and Sophia, as they did say that they were allied with the demons. Shiki mentions that if this is the case then it would be a good opportunity for him to get revenge on them for spilling Makoto's blood, and he gets all fired up, but Lime comes there, and this surprises him. He apologizes for making Makoto worried, and Makoto wonders if he ran into any dragons. Lime states that he didn't, and Makoto notices Eva with him. Lime mentions that he will make his report later, and Shiki gets angry at him for showing up so soon, and Makoto handles him. Makoto then reads Lime's report, and he wonders who is the man that defeated Lime in an instant. Shiki then tells him that Eva wants to speak with him, and Makoto asks Shiki to go to Rona, and have her help him find the organization's collaborators in the academy. Shiki understands, and Makoto speaks with Eva. Eva states that she wanted to speak to him about the information that she promised to give as a reward, and she starts by saying that she knows the individuals in the portrait that Makoto has. 
She states that the man is a noble who held an important office in a certain nation, and the woman is a high-ranking priestess. Makoto is surprised to hear about his parents' background, and Eva mentions that they were to be married in Kaelneon, a small satellite state of the now-ruined kingdom of Elysian, but they were forced to leave the state without ever marrying and they disappeared. She mentions that she doesn't know all the details, but they were exiled, and she states that most of Kalinian's records were destroyed in a major invasion. Makoto realizes that she is talking about the invasion that took place ten years ago, and he has heard that this ended in an overwhelming victory for the demons. He asks her how she knows about the two of them, and Eva states that it's because she is from Kaelneon. She was there when the invasion took place, and only her and Luria managed to escape. They were branded as cowards who abandoned their nation, and ever since, they have lived quietly. They are not even permitted to speak their family name, and those who learn their situation still look coldly at them. They are even subjected to harassment sometimes, and they did consider ending their lives, but they knew that it wouldn't solve anything, so they decided to reclaim Kelneon, or at least the lost lands of the Enslin family. This is why she made a contract with that organization, and she mentions that the members of the organization oppose the goddess. They share technology and knowledge with one another, and this makes them quite powerful. She was investigating them because she thought that she could use them to reclaim Kaelneon, but she ran into line, and they got captured. Makoto understands her situation, and he states that he will do everything he can to keep her out of harm's way. Afterwards at night Makoto thinks that if this organization is powerful enough to reclaim territory from the demons, they might join the war, and he senses someone coming. Lyme informs him that the white-haired boy is coming towards them, and Tomoe and Mio come there. Makoto wonders why they are here, and they mention that Makoto seems to be dealing with a tricky opponent. Mio tells Lyme to retreat, and he refuses to, but Tomoe states that he will only get in their way. Lyme then goes to the demiplane, and the boy comes to their room. He introduces himself as the guild master of the Adventurer's Guild, and he apologizes for what he did to Lyme. They are surprised to hear this, and before he explains his reason for coming here, he asks Mio to get him some fruit. Mio isn't keen on complying, but she listens when Makoto tells her to. Makoto then asks him why he is here, and the guildmaster mentions that there is no need for Makoto to talk by writing, as he is not a human. Makoto tries to feign ignorance, and the guildmaster wonders if he thinks that the goddess has found out about him. He mentions that Makoto shouldn't worry as she is not aware of his current circumstances yet, and she has been making a lot of mistakes lately. Makoto then uses his voice, and he asks the boy who he is. The boy tries to introduce himself, but Tomoe intervenes, and she mentions that he is Luto, also known as Banshoku, and he is a greater dragon. He is undefeated, and Makoto thinks that greater dragons are the most powerful types of all dragons, and Mitsuruji, Bofuku, Sazanami, Akari, and Yamatori are the most famous ones. Ludo states that Shin shouldn't intervene when he is talking to Makoto, and Tomoe asks him to not deceive her master, and she states that she doesn't go by Shin anymore, and she introduces herself. Ludo states that he would never deceive Makoto, and he tries to get close and personal with him, but Tomoe points her sword at him, and she asks him when he became a man. Ludo mentions that it happened 300 years ago, and he states that he had grown bored of being a woman. He mentions that he had a one-night stand with a man, and he experienced a sense of emotional satisfaction and euphoria that he had never felt before. He states that Makoto must be a virgin, and he mentions that Makoto shouldn't worry as he doesn't hate virgins. He mentions that he can captivate Makoto's heart in one day, and Makoto makes some distance from him, and he states that he doesn't want to. Mio then comes there with the fruit, and she wonders what's going on. Ludo states that he was just seducing Makoto, and this makes Mio mad. We see that the other two are also mad at him, and they have no qualms about killing Ludo. Ludo states that he is not here to fight today, he just wants to talk about the Adventurer's Guild, and this piques Makoto's interest. We then see Shiki talking with Rona, and Rona mentions that she will help him with the investigation, but she will use her own methods. Shiki agrees to this, and he leaves, and Rona thinks that this matter can give her an insight on Makoto's powers, as she has already accomplished her real goal. Luto then mentions that he really is the guild master of the Adventurer's Guild, and he was the one who founded it a thousand years ago. He states that his first master was a human from another world, just like Makoto, and he introduced him to this concept. He then suggested the concept to the goddess, and he became the guild master. 
At that time, he actively considered how to design the guild, and he enjoyed establishing the system. The word about the guild spread throughout the world, and it helped solve problems for some communities. The guild members were given licenses that displayed their level, and he wonders if Makoto doesn't find it weird that the sophisticated guild cards used the word level. Makoto thinks that it's a concept from video games of their world, and Tomoe asks him why he created this system. Ludo states that it was to maintain the balance of this world, and he mentions that under the goddess's leadership the humans have multiplied and grown arrogant for ages. The guilds help keep this in check, and he explains that establishing levels and ranks within the guild makes everyone want to climb higher. He has also made the growth rate increase with the levels, and Makoto realizes that seeing their growth as numbers motivates people. Ludo states that joining the guild stirs people's ambitions, and they long for success, and they are slowly destroyed by the weight of their own desires. The guild automatically thins out the human population, and Tomoe thinks that this is a rather roundabout way to preserve world balance. Luto then states that the highest level in the guild is 65,535, and Makoto thinks that this is the highest possible value in 16-bit computing, and it appeared frequently in old games. Makoto then asks Luto, how a thousand-year-old human can know about video games, and Luto explains that the flow of time between this world and Makoto's world is different. He gives a complicated explanation for this, but Makoto doesn't understand any of it, and he asks Luto about his odds of returning to his original world. Ludo states that this is possible, but it's nearly impossible, and at his current mana level, he might be able to teleport successfully, but his destination would be too random. He has a 1 in 10 million chance of success, and Makoto thinks that Shiki also said something similar. Ludo mentions that Makoto should take a look around this world for now, and he states that he will take his leave now. Tomoe guides him out, so he can't cause any more trouble, and on the way out, she asks Luto if humans from Makoto's world really die when they reach 100 years of age. Luto mentions that it's uncommon for them to even reach 100, and Tomoe thinks that their lives are too short. Luto mentions that she will just have to get used to it, and Tomoe states that Makoto was everything to her, and if he dies, then the world will lose its luster. Luto mentions that it will also make him lonely, as it's fun for him to observe Makoto, and he states that Makoto doesn't like killing others, but it pains him to see his allies getting hurt. His thinking and judgment are incredibly ordinary, but he has chosen to follow an extraordinary path, and Tomoe asks Luto if Makoto is going to try to return home. Luto states that he doesn't know, but Makoto isn't heartless enough to abandon them, and he might choose a different option than staying or leaving. Tomoe wonders what he means, and he states that Makoto might find a way to travel freely between the two worlds. He states that a catalyst might awaken that possibility within him, and he is looking forward to what catalyst awakens this possibility. He then leaves, and Mio comes there. She is glad to see that the pervy dragon has left, and Tomoe states that Mio shouldn't go around dressed like this, as people might start spreading rumors about their young master. Mio mentions that they can simply make everyone who sees her forget everything, and Tomoe wonders what she should do with Mio, and Mio states that she can say the same about her. She mentions that it won't be good if Tomoe ever loses her mind, and tries to do something to the young master. Tomoe states that this will never happen, and if it does, Mio should return her to her senses by slapping her. Mio states that she will, and they both return to the inn. The scene then cuts to Lime telling Makoto that he was planning to investigate one step at a time, but Rona used threats, seduction, and deception, and Shiki mentions that she didn't even care about keeping the investigation a secret. Makoto thinks that Shiki is still critical of Rona's actions, and he mentions that he would like for them to get along, but Shiki states that he can never get along with someone like her, as she is loathsome, and she can't be trusted. Makoto states that at least she identified the people connected to them in just a few days, and the forest ogres also don't like her, and they mention that the outfit she wears is too revealing. Makoto thinks that the outcome of the investigation is totally unexpected, and he might start distrusting all humans. He mentions that he is going to discuss their future plans with Rona, and the scene cuts to him meeting her at Five Irons. Rona tells Makoto that she has achieved her goal, so she will be leaving the city, and she asks him if she can count on him to take care of the organization. She apologizes that Makoto was going to have one less student in his class, and she states that she has arranged for the academy to be notified about Karen's death over the summer break. Makoto mentions that she doesn't need to tell them that Karen is dead, as this will shock the other students, and she should say that it's due to her family's circumstances. 
Rona agrees, and she tells Makoto that his undercover agents are a little lacking. She mentions that there is nothing wrong with ethics and morality, but to be effective in the world of espionage, he should encourage them to use nefarious methods. Makoto thanks her for the suggestion, and Karen states that Makoto is the best human she has ever met, as he doesn't differentiate between demi-humans and demons. She mentions that she would even consider granting him an audience with the demon king, and Makoto appreciates the offer, but he refuses. Rona then states that she has one last advice for him, and she mentions that he should cut ties with the forest ogres and Shiki. She explains that Makoto might not know it, but those ogres are well known for being brutal demi-humans, and some of the demons wanted to recruit them for their combat powers, but they don't tolerate serving others. They are going to betray him someday, and Makoto thinks that she is right, but this won't happen as long as he keeps giving them bananas. Rona then states that Shiki is possessed, and he is neither a human, nor a demon, he is a lich. Makoto thinks that he is not possessed, this is his actual body, and Rona states that among demons he was known as Larva, and they have both worked against and with him. The one thing she can say for certain is that he can never be trusted, and Makoto thinks that the two of them are like-minded. Rona warns Makoto to watch out for them, and she gives him a piece of paper telling him that if he ever wants to cooperate with the demons, he will be able to contact her telepathically using this. She then disappears, and afterwards Makoto shows the paper to Tomoe, and she mentions that this incantation may help them understand the cursed item that disrupts the goddess's blessing, and Tomoe states that Rona might be quite a schemer. It's possible that she was trying to win Makoto's favor, and Makoto mentions that he knows that he has to keep a clear mind and be vigilant. He then remembers that Lime has been speaking with him normally as of late, and he asks Tomoe if Lime is still human. Tomoe hesitantly mentions that she gave him a bit of her blood, and Makoto can't believe that she made him into her kin. Tomoe reflects on her actions, and Makoto tells her that he is going to be stricter from now on. He mentions that he wants to settle this matter with the organization quickly, as Eva and Luria's safety also depends on this, and Tomoe and Mio ask him to let them handle the rest. Makoto states that he can't do that, as this is his job, and they accept his decision. The scene then cuts to Makoto interrogating Blight, and he apologizes for everything that his subordinates have put him through. Blight mentions that he seems to have underestimated Makoto, and Makoto states that he is not that great, but he has some exceptional followers. Blight mentions that he must also know about the organization in this case, and Makoto states that he does. Blight mentions that Makoto will have to pay if he does anything to him, as he has allies all over the world, and Makoto mentions that he has already been abandoned by them, as there are no movements for his rescue, and there is also not a peep from the assassination guild. Blight can't believe that he knows about the guild as well, and Makoto then asks him why he didn't simply perform his job as a teacher. He mentions that Blight has no reason to defy the goddess as he is a human, and Blight mentions that the goddess is the only deity in this world. He assists and abandons humans on a whim, and countless wars have been started because of her. It was inevitable that an organization like them was formed, given her egotistical behavior, and he mentions that the goddess is not qualified to rule over them, and the humans can survive fine without her. He mentions that there is something wrong with the people who let her off the hook just because she is the goddess, and Makoto wonders why he has dragged demi-humans into his experiments if this is the case. Blight states that the humans are sacrificing themselves, so it's only natural for the demi-humans to do the same, and Makoto mentions that he has heard enough of this, and he kills Blight. The scene then cuts to the academy, and we see the students planning how to spend their upcoming summer break. The Rembrandt sisters then come there, and everyone clears the way for them. Ilumvan's friends also notice them, and one of them mentions that he has heard that they have become nicer recently. The other states that this is not true, and he has heard that they went after the girls who approached instructor Makoto, and people are also saying that they are the reason that Professor Blight quit his job. Ilungan then starts feeling bad, and his friends ask him if something is wrong, but he states that it's nothing, and later he thinks that he needs to take more of this medicine. The scene then cuts to Makoto's students talking with each other, and Abelia mentions that it's sad that Karen had to quit due to her family's circumstances. She states that since they are down by a student Sif and Yuno will be asked to join their next torture lesson, and we find out that they are talking about their mock battle with Liddy. They think that they are no match for him, and Mishra states that they will have to work together to somehow break his defenses. They try to come up with a plan to fight him, and after discussing for a while they have a solid plan. 
The scene then cuts to Makoto taking his last class before summer break, and he introduces his students to another lizard man named Vi. They are surprised to see that there is another one of them now, and Makoto mentions that they wouldn't learn anything if they only kept fighting seven against one. Abelia wonders if the both of them have the same level of strength, and Makoto tells them that they are equally skilled. We then see that the students have been defeated by them, and they think that all of their planning went to waste. Afterwards Makoto tells Shiki that Rembrandt has sent him a ridiculous letter asking him to bring his daughters home, and Shiki asks him what he is going to do. Jean then comes there, and he tells Makoto that the students want to talk to him about something. Makoto goes to them, and they ask him to train them over the summer break. They mention that they will pay him for the classes, and Makoto wonders if this is what they all want. He tells Sif and Yuno that their father has been asking them to return home, and the sisters state that they have no problem with staying here for six months, and they ask him to train them. Makoto asks Shiki to check if he has time in his schedule, and Shiki mentions that they can afford to hold one lesson a week, but Makoto isn't happy with his response. He then notices the expecting faces of his students, and he agrees to hold lessons once a week, but he mentions that Sif and Yuno will have to return home for the second half of the break. They are not happy with this, but Makoto states that they are still recovering from their illness so they should go home and put the minds of their parents at ease, and they agree. Afterwards we see Eva searching for a book, and she remembers that she offered to give Makoto a part of the land of the Enslin family as thanks for offering her and her sister protection, but Makoto mentioned that he couldn't accept such a reward. Eva told him that this is all she can offer, and Makoto stated that she can just recommend him a book as thanks. Eva then continues her search, and she thinks that she needs to find the perfect book. We then see that the students have finally managed to defeat Liddy, and Shiki mentions that they did great. He heals them, and he states that they should spend the rest of their time fighting Liddy version 2. Liddy then increases his power, and they fight him once more, but he wipes the floor with them. The scene then cuts to the rest of the students fighting Zvi, and Mishra asks Sif to finish off this jerk, but this makes Zvi angry. She stops to hold back, and she beats up the students to a pulp. Afterwards Makoto apologizes to the students for this, and they ask him how Zvi became stronger suddenly. Makoto then explains that the blue lizards are actually stronger than low-ranking dragons. They have only been using one-tenth of their strength to fight them, and the students can't believe this, and they wonder why Zvi used more strength towards the end of their fight. Makoto then tells them that Zvi is a female, and when they called her a jerk, she got angry. Makoto states that they shouldn't let this stop them from trying again, and the students then ask Zvi to have a rematch with them. Afterwards Makoto treats them to dinner at Five Irons, and they leave happily. Makoto asks Shiki if he said something to them, and Shiki mentions that he recommended them to raise their levels by fighting monsters. This reminds Makoto that they are members of the Adventurer's Guild, and if they raise their level then they can benefit from the pervert dragon system. He doubts that they will be consumed by ambition, and Shiki mentions that they will be fine, as he showed them a good place to raise their level. Makoto tells Shiki that he appreciates the help, but he mentions that they won't be completely safe from danger. He then gets an idea, and he wonders if they still have bananas in the shop. The scene then cuts to the students defeating some monsters in the wild, and they notice that they have gained 8 levels today. They think that it's thanks to the lessons of Shiki and Makoto, and Abelia thinks that she loves Shiki. The students then make a camp to stay the night, and the next day they come across a demi-dragon. They find out that demi-dragons are weak to ice, and they require at least 10 party members of level 90 or higher to defeat one. They notice that they have an average level of 75, but they still try to fight it. The dragon roars at them, and this paralyzes all of the students. The dragon then tries to use his breath attack on them, but Eris saves them by capturing the dragon using her magic. The students wonder who she is, and Eris defeats the dragon with ice magic, and she disappears. The students wonder what just happened, and Makoto thinks that the students are never going to find out that bananas were the reason that they were saved that day. The scene then cuts to Makoto asking Ludo for a way to increase the amount of mana he can expend at once. He states that he feels like his mana output is not that efficient, and Ludo mentions that in most cases there isn't anything that people can do to increase their own mana. Makoto states that this may be the case, but his maximum has increased from earlier. Ludo mentions that if a research organization found out about this, they will have Makoto dissected, 
and he states that he would also like to know how Makoto increased his mana. Makoto mentions that he just practices archery every day, and Ludo states that he does have something that might be of help to Makoto. He then gives him a notebook consisting of training methods related to mana, and he mentions that he is not sure if they are going to be effective. Ludo then states that Makoto was a teacher and a merchant, but he is as studious as a student, and Makoto states that it may be because the academy is on a break right now, and he always feels restless before breaks. He just feels like doing a lot of things to remedy this, and Luto hopes that Makoto has a wonderful summer vacation. The scene then cuts to Makoto in the library, and Eva recommends him a book. She mentions that Makoto seemed to be interested in the use of mana, so she found this unusual book for him. She mentions that the book is based on unique theories that only true connoisseurs can appreciate, and Makoto realizes that it's a book for hardcore nerds. He states that it does sound interesting, and he mentions that this gives him another goal for the summer break. Eva states that he sounds like a student, and Makoto thinks that he did used to be one not long ago. Makoto then goes to the demi-plane, and he spends two weeks reading the book, training, and doing his managerial duties. The scene then cuts to Emma apologizing to Makoto for keeping him busy every day, and Makoto states that he doesn't mind it, as he will be busy again once the academy starts, so he would like to take care of everything in the demiplane before then. Emma is glad to have a master like him, and Makoto states that they should get started on today's schedule. Emma then tells Makoto that today he has a mock battle with the Winkin, and she mentions that they have already fought the orcs and the others several times. So far, they have been undefeated, and Makoto thinks that they must be strong. Emma states that their ability to fly gives them a major advantage, and she mentions with a fired-up attitude that with a few more battle the orcs will surely start to win. Makoto then goes to fight the Winkin, and he asks Emma where they are. Emma mentions that they are in those woods, and she leaves after announcing the start of the battle. The Winkin then fly out of the forest to attack Makoto, and Makoto hits them with his brids, and this takes out their entire unit. He can't believe that they are this weak, and the second wave of the Winkin then comes out to attack, and they take cover behind the clouds, so Makoto can't see them, but Makoto uses his investigative kai to locate them, and he hits them all with brids. He thinks that they have no defense against long-range attacks, and to him they are just flying targets. The elder Kaken then tries to fight Makoto, and Makoto notices that he is flying on a giant bird, and he thinks that the bird must be Shona, as he has heard that Winkin can transform into large birds. Makoto tries using his brids on them as well, but they have no effect on them, and he is happy to see that they have defenses for long-range attacks. They then use wind and enhancement magic, and Makoto realizes that they are planning to ram into him, and he thinks that the security of being airborne has simplified their attacks. He catches them when they try to ram him, and Kaken tries to attack him separately, but Makoto manages to defeat him easily. They then surrender, and Makoto tells the Winkin that this was their first mock battle, and from what he can tell, they rely too much on their ability to fly. In the near future, the Highland Orcs and the others will crush them in battle, and they should also stop ramming into their opponents, as it makes them an easy target for concentrated fire. Taking up positions in the sky and developing several attack patterns can be a good strategy for them, and they should start their training from there. He states that this will be all for today, and Kaken mentions that they would like to participate in developing the land and the demiplane rankings. Makoto mentions that anyone can participate in the demiplane rankings at their own risk, but he can't allow them to develop the land, as their combat abilities make them unsuited for the job. The Winkin are disappointed to hear this, and Makoto asks them to focus on developing their strength for now. The scene then cuts to Makoto reading the book he got from Eva, and he learns the concept of materializing mana. It's too much for his brain to take in, and the scene cuts to Makoto practicing this in a deserted area. He starts by releasing his mana, and he keeps firing brids while unleashing large amounts of mana. He maintains this output level, and he keeps focusing. He then notices something strange happening to him, and the scene cuts to Mio and Tomoe waking up Makoto the next morning. They ask him what he was doing outdoors, and Makoto wonders if he passed out because of firing brids all night. He thinks that this has happened to him before, and he remembers the time when he was doing archery practice, and Tomoe and Mio got worried about him. Makoto then thanks Tomoe and Mio for all their help, and he states that they should head back. The scene cuts to Makoto eating the breakfast made by Mio, and Tomoe tries to take his persimmon and mashed tofu salad, but Mio stops her, 
and she asks her to limit herself to her own portion. Tomoe states that it's Mio's fault for making something that goes so well with alcohol, so early in the morning, and Makoto asks Tomoe to cut back on the alcohol, but Tomoe doesn't listen to him and she keeps on drinking. Several days then pass by, and we see Makoto practicing the materialization of mana, and he states that he has finally learned to utilize the mana outside of his body. He won't ever enter a trance-like state again, and he remembers that there was an incantation at the end of the book that might make his mana materialize. He tries out the incantation, and he manages to make an armor of mana around himself. He tests to find out how strong this armor is, and he notices that it's quite strong, and with this he might be able to fight the goddess, and even the dragon slayer without suffering any injuries. He thinks that for the sake of the demiplane, he can't afford to fall down, and if anyone is going to fall down, it will be him, and no one else. Afterwards we see that the citizens of the demiplane are gathered to show their new combat skills, and Tomoe mentions that they would like to show Makoto the results of their training. Makoto then notices a large boulder in the area where the citizens are going to show their new skills, and Shiki explains that the boulder has a special spell cast on it, and when they unleash their new skills on it, their power will be shown as a number. Mio states that she is not that interested in combat skills, and she mentions that she would prefer a cooking contest instead. The show of skills then begins, and first are the Highland Orcs. Makoto notices that Agarez and Emma are representing them, and Tomoe informs Makoto that Emma is the greatest mage among the Highland Orcs. Emma then uses enhancement magic on Agarez, and he hits the boulder with his hammer, and this gives him a score of 78. Tomoe mentions that this is quite a good score, and she states that the others are going to have a hard time topping it. Next is the Mist Lizard, and they hit the boulder with their Mist Breath, and they manage to score 68 points. Burin represents the Elder Dwarves, and he uses a magic weapon to attack the boulder, and this gives him 70 points. The Gorgons try to use their petrification eyes on the boulder, but it does nothing, and they score 0 points. The Alke score 65 points, and the Winkin only manage to score 20 points. Makoto thinks that they have good accuracy, but they lack power. It is then the forest ogre's turn, and they perform a weird dance, and they then surround the boulder with a barrier. They mention that this barrier is impenetrable, and they ask everyone to try to break it if they can. Everyone tries to attack the barrier with their special moves, but they can't even put a dent on it, and the barrier manages to neutralize all of their weapons. Makoto is surprised that the barrier is capable of offense, and Tomoe mentions that this barrier is nearly perfect. Makoto then uses his kai on the barrier, and he thinks that it's not perfect at all. We then see Makoto inside the barrier, and he tells the ogre sisters that he broke through it. They wonder how he managed this, and we see that Makoto dug a tunnel to get inside. He tells the ogre sisters to consider this shortcoming, and he dispels the barrier, and they get 50 points for it. Mio states that now it's her turn, and Tomoe mentions that she said that she wasn't interested in it. Mio states that she is not, but she doesn't want to miss the opportunity to demonstrate her other hobbies besides cooking. We find out that she is talking about her hobby of watching anime, and Mio uses her powers to create a superhero suit, but the boulder has no reaction to it. It is then Shiki's turn, and Tomoe mentions that Shiki seems to have acquired a new ability of his own. Shiki uses his new ability called 13 Steps, and his staff transforms into a sword. Makoto wonders if the dwarves made that weapon for him, and Tomoe states that they did, and it is even effective against dragons. They called it a dragon slayer blade, and Makoto wonders if Shiki is planning to fight Lancer with this. Shiki then attacks the boulder, and he cuts it in half. Makoto commends him for this, and Tomoe wonders if he will be able to hit anything with that blade. Makoto mentions that Shiki has been watching the progress of Mio and Tomoe in training, and he has been working hard, so he is sure that he is going to be fine. Makoto then mentions that he will end this by showing his new skill, and he goes to the boulder. Everyone is excited for what he is going to show them, and Makoto unleashes his mana, and he materializes it. He then uses his mana armor to punch the boulder, and this breaks it into tiny pieces. Everyone is surprised to see this, and he asks them what they think about this. We then see that some monsters have sensed the current of mana that he just released, and they think that this might be a threat to them, and they should do something about this. We then see an orc running from some beasts, and the beasts defeat the orc, and they ask him to leave this forest alone, or they won't let him leave in one piece, the next time. 
Makoto then hears about this, and he finds out that the beasts were a bear and a wolf. Tomoe tells him that since Shiki has returned to the academy, Emma is treating the orc, and Makoto wonders where he was attacked. He finds out that he was attacked in the woods to the north, and he wonders if this is related to the irregular weather changes. He thinks that the weather should stabilize if he manages to create a mist gate in the right place, and Tomoe states that they are currently looking into this. Mio then mentions that she has heard that bears are quite a delicacy, and Makoto stops her train of thought, and he mentions that bears and wolves are considered sacred in some parts of Japan. He then states that he would like to talk to them if they can communicate, and Tomoe mentions that he seems to think highly of them. Makoto states that to him they are special, just like the dragons of fantasy world that he admires, and Tomoe mentions that there is a dragon right in front of him. Makoto is not interested, and Mio wonders what he thinks about spiders. Makoto can't say anything about this, and the scene cuts to him in the forest. He then comes across a bear, and he gets behind it. He hugs the bear, and he thinks that its fur is really soft and smooth. The bear then tries to attack him, but he takes it out using his mana armor. Makoto then senses the wolf there, and he mentions that he is only here to talk. The wolf tries to attack him, but he can't get through his mana armor, and he notices that there are more than one. The leader of the wolves then states that the other day they sensed an extraordinary current of mana, and he wonders if that was Makoto. Makoto mentions that it was, and the leader states that Makoto seems to be the king of this land, and therefore, they can't ignore him. Makoto mentions that he is not interested in ruling over them, and he only came to apologize since they are neighbors. He states that in the future, no one will enter these woods without contacting them first, and if they need anything, he is going to help them out. The wolf leader is surprised to hear this, and Makoto tells him that they are going to coexist. He mentions that he would like for the wolves to continue defending these woods like usual, and the leader wonders how this benefits Makoto. Makoto mentions that he just wants to be friends, and the wolf is surprised to hear this. A giant bear then comes there laughing, and he introduces himself as Brownie. He mentions that they accept Makoto's kindness, and they agree to be his friends. The wolf leader states that they will continue to rule over these woods free from Makoto's control, and he tells Brownie that Makoto was an interesting guy, but he is not sure if the one in the sky will accept this. Brownie asks him to not mind that guy, as he will show himself when he wants to get involved, and Makoto states that this is how a sanctuary known as the Wolf's Woods was established in the demiplane. Afterwards we see Makoto scolding Tomoe and Komoe for harvesting too many persimmons from the trees, and he states that they should also leave some for other creatures, but Tomoe still tries to pick a persimmon, but Makoto stops her. A giant eagle then comes there, and Tomoe tries to fight it, but the eagle states that he is just here to introduce himself to their king. He mentions that the wolf leader told him what happened, and he transforms into a much smaller form to talk to Makoto. Makoto introduces himself to the eagle, and the eagle introduces himself as Boulder Bird, the ruler of the skies and mountains. Makoto thinks that he has only ever heard of Rock Bird, and the Boulder Bird states that going forward he intends to watch the skies for Makoto. He mentions that he would like to hear any ideas that Makoto has, and Makoto mentions that he has no problem with him doing what he has been, and the bird understands, but he states that he has one request, and he wonders if he can call himself Rockbird from now on, as he likes this name. Makoto allows it and the bird then leaves. Makoto then states that he seems to have gained more followers, and Tomoe mentions that those who haven't formed contracts with Makoto cannot be called his followers. Makoto wonders if she is jealous, and he mentions that she is right, as Mio, Tomoe and Shiki are his only followers. This makes Tomoe blush, and they head back. The scene then cuts to Jean meeting Abelia for some drinks, and he wonders why she wanted to go out for drinks. Abelia states that it was just a whim, and the scene cuts to them in a bar. While drinking Abelia asks Jean what Shiki's type of woman, and Jean mentions that they have never had the chance to speak like this. Abelia states that it's because both of their hands were full, as scholarship students are tossed out when their grades fall, and they were more like rivals than friends. The both of them then try to say something together, and Abelia lets Jean go first. Jean then mentions that there is something he wants to do before summer break ends, and he states that he wants to defeat the Drake. He mentions that he would have accepted his defeat if their victory was impossible, and Abelia states that they could have defeated that Drake. She mentions that she is sure that the others are also frustrated, 
and they decide that their last summer break activity is going to be to defeat the drake. With this decided Abelia asks Jean why he came to the academy. She wonders if he was scouted as well, and we find out that the both of them were scouted. Abelia states that she wasn't getting anywhere until she met Makoto, and Jean tells her the same. He then asks her if she is not going back home, and she states that she has nowhere to return to. She mentions that it was just her and her mother and her family, but her mother died in an epidemic, and she states that Jean also doesn't go home, and she wonders if there is a reason for this. Jean states that there is, and he explains that there was an orphan girl named Miranda in his village. She was forced to fight monsters and handle tough jobs, and she was way stronger than him. Abelia wonders if she was his master in the sword, but she finds out that Miranda was his first love. Jean then mentions that eventually he started helping out Miranda, and one day the village ordered them to investigate the Forbidden Forest. While investigating they came across a mage's research lab, and they got attacked by a chimera while looking around. The chimera managed to injure Jean, but Miranda fought it with a smile on her face, and seeing her enjoy herself so much made Jean think that she is creepy. Miranda then defeated the chimera, but Jean called her a monster, and she ran away. Jean states that after this he never saw Miranda, and he couldn't forgive the village he grew in, or his own powerlessness. This is why he honed his skills, and jumped onto the academy's offer when they scouted him. He wants to become as strong as Miranda, and apologize to her, and Abelia states that this is one heck of a reason, and she realizes that the drake is the first obstacle that he has to overcome. The scene then cuts to Makoto finding out that his students are planning a rematch against the drake. He wonders if they are being secretive about this because they think that he would be angry if he found out, and he asks Eris what they plan to do about the Rembrandt sisters as they went home already. Shiki mentions that Lime did report that they went home, but they have returned to slay a drake. They are currently working on a plan to take down a drake with the others, and Makoto thinks that they shouldn't lose to a drake with their current strength. He states that he won't have Eris watch over them this time, but Eris tells him to not be so quick to decide this, as a pack of drakes have gathered at that place. Makoto thinks that this is unusual, and he can't think that this is a coincidence. Shiki mentions that he would like to investigate the area with Makoto's permission, and Makoto tells him to do it. He wonders what they should do with the students, and Eris suggests that they should put a drake at the place where the students encountered it the last time, as this is where they are likely going to search for it. Makoto likes the idea, and he mentions that he will take care of the pack of drakes, as he would like to test his mana armor. The scene then cuts to Shiki investigating the drakes in the forest, and he comes across the sacred treasure of Elysian, the scepter of dragons. He thinks that this was supposed to be destroyed, and he contacts Makoto via telepathy. He wonders if Makoto can see an altar similar to what he is seeing, and Makoto mentions that he can. Shiki informs him that someone must have performed a ritual to activate the sacred treasure, and Makoto realizes that the drakes were summoned here. Shiki mentions that this seems like the work of demons, and Makoto asks Shiki to continue his investigation while he deals with the drakes. Makoto then finds the pack of drakes, and he puts one of them in the demiplane to protect it for the students. He then fights the drakes, and he manages to block their breath attack with his mana armor. Meanwhile Shiki finds out that this was the work of resistance fighters in the demon army, and he wonders why there is resistance in the demon army, as he has heard that the current demon king is an exceptional ruler. A demon mentions that they hate him because he is too exceptional, and he dies. Shiki is sad that he wasn't able to uncover the details of their plan, and he thinks that he can't report this to Makoto. Afterwards we see that Makoto has defeated the drakes, and he gets some of their meat, as Mio asked for this. We then see that the students have also managed to locate a drake, and they take their battle formations. Jean attacks the dragon with his sword, and the dragon then uses its breath attack, and Abelia protects everyone with a barrier, but this is not enough, and Mitra uses a skill to absorb breath attacks. Dina then uses his magic to boost his mobility, defense and attack, and he deals heavy damage to the dragon. Izumo then restricts the drake's movements, and Mitra attacks it with a flaming sword. Afterwards Abelia hits it with an arrow, and Sif prepares her most powerful attack. Izumo uses his magic to stop the drake's movements, and prevent it from dodging the attack, and Sif hits it with her spell. This blows the drake to bits, and the students are happy to see this. Jean then thinks that he needs to get even stronger, 
and if he continues down this path, he will surely find Miranda someday. The scene then cuts to Sophia at the research lab where Miranda defeated the Chimera, and Lancer asks her what she is doing here. Sophia mentions that she once slew a creepy Chimera with human arms spouting from its back here, and Lancer states that this is one of the strongest monsters that are used to defend a mage's workshop. Sophia mentions that she knows this, and she states that this workshop belongs to Ludo. She learned her true name here, and we find out that Sophia is actually Miranda, and she was created by Ludo. She then wonders if Jean still remembers her, and she thinks that this doesn't matter as she is not Miranda anymore. She leaves the workshop, and she asks Ludo to watch out as she is going to kill every last greater dragon. Thanks for watching parts 1 to 12, the rest of the parts will be on my channel. Please like and share the video if you enjoyed it, and make sure to hit the subscribe button, and turn on the notification bell to keep getting new anime recap updates.